Oh, how I've missed you. It's been so long. It's been four whole months creep. since the last can jam, and we are back. We are finally we are, back. We are finally back. <laughs> you creepy guy. If you're creeping me out, you're creeping them out. But but it's true. I mean, I literally feel sometimes like we've been sitting in these chairs for four months just waiting. I'm going stir crazy. For the next show. The last one was Can Jam Dallas 2023 yes. in, in November of 2023. Yep. So four months ago. Yeah. And we've just become increasingly antsy the further we got from the last show. Oh, yeah. Great I, show, by the way. It was fantastic. We're going to be doing another Dallas this year. I'm looking forward to that. We're not here to talk about Dallas. We're here to talk yeah. about New York, which is how we're starting off Can Jam 2024 season. Yep. March 9th and 10th, uh, Times Square, Marriott Marquis Hotel. So for those that have been to Can Jam New York before, it's going to feel very comfortable. For us, it feels like a homecoming, or at least for me, because we've been doing it since 2017 there, and it just feels right to be in Times Square. Yeah. Now, if, if you're a Can Jam New York veteran, um, it's still going to look, I mean, this one's going to look different. Yeah, the hotel will look the same, but we are going to look We're going to look different. different. So this is going to be the biggest can jam we've done so far. Yes. The most exhibitors we've ever had at a single show. Yes. So when you walk in from mm -hmm. the front of the front exhibit door to the to the back wall and then side to side. Oh, we're packed. It's completely packed. There's not a single space open. Now we have the side exhibit area rooms. Also packed. Also packed completely. We actually had a waiting list for exhibitors this yeah. year. Yeah. And so we even had to relocate seminars to another floor, yeah. which we'll get to shortly, but that's how busy it's going to be. Yeah. Now, I want to mention at this point that um, Can Jam New York 2024 is sponsored by Campfire Audio, Headphones.com, CoBuzz, and Viva Audio. Yeah, and, and I'm so excited to have them along for the ride because they're helping us put on what I feel is going to be an exceptional show this year. Yeah, we couldn't do it without them. So thanks again to Campfire Audio, Headphones.com, CoBuzz, and Viva Audio. So big show. Big show. A lot of gear. Oh, this yeah. might be the most gear we've seen come through in a short period of time at Head by HQ, maybe mm -hmm. ever. I think so. And so even though so much is here, it's still just a small sampling of a very big show. Right. We couldn't even come close to showing all of oh, it. Oh, no. But we better get right to it. Over the last several years in our crazy Head Fi community, I feel like everything had been moving to portable. It does kind of feel that way. IEMs, yeah. DAPs, portable DAC amps, dongles. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm heartened because I feel like recently there's been a big resurgence also of great new exciting desktop gear. Yes. Now, I don't back. know if it's because of, you know, things that have been happening the last few years. You know, right. we've been spending a lot more time at our desks, a lot yep. of us. I've always spent a lot of time at a desk. I have always been excited by great desktop rigs. And I feel like this is an exciting time for that. Oh, yeah. At Can Jam New York, there will be a lot of great desktop gear. We have a few pieces here. Yeah. I want to start with the Ever Solo DMP A8 streamer. We were yeah. both super excited by this piece. Yes. Um, headphones.com. Send it to us so you'll be able to find it at headphones.com's exhibit. So last year, Ever Solo, mm -hmm. a company, I, I don't even, I, I don't think I'd even heard of them till last year. Did they exist before last year? I, but it, I'm not sure. But yeah, so last year, Ever Solo took the world by storm. Yep. With the DMP A6. Yeah. So you couldn't watch a review, like an audio review video channel, without eventually seeing it pop up. And it right. won all sorts of awards. But then then this year, I think it was this year, or recently, they, they did this. Yeah. The DMP A8, where they improved on just about everything that anybody using an A6 would want improved, if they yep. could, like, wish list it. And I'm really, we were both really excited about this one. Very much. So... You're definitely more apt to use more of its features. I may use some of the more, uh, yeah, the, the more in-depth features. So the A6 was probably, I, I think it's fair to say, you described it as... Yeah, uh, I never used it myself, but the vibe that I got was yeah. kind of like a well-made Swiss Army knife. It, it felt like, from the reviews that I was reading, it did a lot of things and it did a lot of things well. Right. So the DMP A8 kind of seems, from what I was reading about the A6, like an evolution of the a a A6 in all the right places, yeah. just from my vibe. So this is kind of one of those things that's going to appeal to a wide variety of head fires. Um, whether you're a streamer, whether you're somebody who likes to play back locally, whether you just want to get other kinds of content through it for your headphones, it's phenomenal all around, I think. And let's start with the streaming services because it's a streamer. Right. So pretty much every single music service I know of, even plenty that I've never heard of as far as I'm aware, um, are already built in you're ready to go and if you are looking for something that's maybe a little less common it's available to download 
Um, it does offer Rune. It's not fully Rune certified yet, but that is coming. Yeah. So that's on the way. I think yeah. the A6 already has that. The A8, right. yeah. it'll be here. So that's coming soon. Pretty much every kind of streaming service, you're you're set to go. But if you don't want to stream, it's got built-in storage. Not a lot, but it's got some to get you started. Then it's got expandable storage. Right. M2 SSD, I believe it is, up to four terabytes, if I'm not mistaken. USB on the go. Just plug in an external solid-state drive with the music library on it. You're set. Um, it can incorporate itself as a fantastic preamp. It serves great as a DAC. Um, it's got a cool knob that we'll talk about later, but... <laughs> Pretty much any kind of input and output you could want is on this thing, including something that we're starting to see on more devices, and I'm so excited to have it, ARC and eARC, which is that yeah. audio return channel from devices like TVs, for example. You can run Netflix out to this, hook this up to a headphone rig, or run it into a stereo system at home for a nice two-channel Netflix setup. It's just so very flexible. Yeah, when it comes to something like this, you are definitely, a, I think, a more sophisticated user than I am. You you definitely use it in those kinds of systems. Where I want to play with the toys, yeah. <laughs> right, where you'd use ARC and eARC. For me, I have it in a simpler s setup, just a desktop audio setup, mm -hmm. and I still, I don't think I love it any less than you do. So as a DAC, I think it's fantastic already, yeah, just as a DAC. So they upgraded the DAC, for example, to... Um, I well, think, the old one had an ESS, I think. I think the, the A6 has ESS, and then this has... Yeah. AKM's flagship, yes, which is the AK forty one ninety one EQ plus AK forty four ninety nine EX. Yep, I love the way this sounds as a DAC. It's beautiful for that. You mentioned the storage. We did not expand the storage. It comes with sixty four gigs embedded. We we have not played with that yet. I'd love to do that though because I have just like gobs of groovy music locally stored at, yeah. at my home. I have a big NAS unit. Yep, I have a whole bunch of different disparate drives. It's got Ethernet for that. Yeah, so yeah, just run right in. And and I love the touch screen. Yeah. Same, I think it's the same or identi nearly identical or identical screen to what's on the DMPA6, which I love. Might be, yeah. I love the VU meters. We're both suckers yes. for that. Yes. Uh, and it has an app. Yeah. Now, I want to mention something. You may have mentioned the fact that it's a digital, I mean, not a digital, it's, it's essentially an, a, a fully bounced analog preamp. Yes, it is. And I want to, I want to emphasize that because this mm -hmm. cannot be emphasized enough because it's such a groovy feature, which is the R to R the resistor volume control. So yep. it's an analog volume control. I yeah. love the clicks. Oh, it's so nice. When you turn it. And for those who don't understand why that's so important, with a with a beautifully designed analog volume control like this, there's no degradation mm -hmm. of the signal. So there's no manipulation of the signal other than to lower and raise uh, yep. the, the levels, but with resistors. Yes. Anyway, it's a groovy thing. So we're both obviously very excited about this. I think a lot of head fires would be. I'd love oh, yeah. the fact that you and I have just such completely different use cases That's true. for it, and yet we both still love it. Yeah. So make sure to go to headphones.com's exhibit. Definitely check out the, the Eversolo DMP A8. Now, coming from the Eversolo, mm -hmm. I wanted to pivot into the FIO R9. Sure. Because it's another product for which we both use it very differently. Yeah. Um, but yet we're both equally excited about it. Uh, so I think some people might have looked at the R9, thought it was the R7. They might have, yeah. Yeah, but it's not. It's the R9. If you put them next to each other, it's clear. They're oh, different. One's brighter, one's bigger, yeah. 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 So so the FIO R9 is so hard to describe. I'm going to go with FIO's description. Sure. Uh, which is a flagship all-in-one digital media streamer that integrates flagship-level transmission, decoding, headphone amp, jukebox, preamp functionality into <laughs> one device. Yeah. We're laughing because it's like not inaccurate, but yet no. it's somewhat inaccurate in that it doesn't that doesn't even cover it all. Right. So it does even more. Yeah, it's fully incomplete. Um, but hey, it was a, a worthy try to give it a they gave succinct it a stab. description. Yeah. Yeah. So so let's talk about that. Yes. You again, let's just get it out of the way. You're excited about the HDMI, which the the R7 does not have. No, the the R9 has the uh, arc audio return channel, so I can incorporate it into a media system or hook it up to like a a gaming console or something. It just really simplifies the whole process. I right. love it. And I love that you use it that way. Yeah. But that I don't, and yet we both love it. Yeah. So, so for me, I use it as more just dedicated audio. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's a it's in a simple desktop audio system. What I love about it is a small footprint. I mean, it's tiny. Yeah. Um, well, I want to talk really quickly because you know I'm I'm more excited. I think because I don't use the HDMI, I'm more excited about the wireless codecs. Sure. So, yeah. um, this supports SBC AAC, pretty bog standard. Yep. But Aptex, Aptex Low Latency, Aptex HD, Aptex Adaptive, and LDAC. Yeah. So I love the wireless connectivity. And I want to talk about, we mentioned that it has HDMI, R7 doesn't. Some of the other things that it improved on mm -hmm. the R7 with that I think definitely have to be mentioned, the DAC. Yes. 
So the R7 uses dual ESS 9068AS DACs. This uses the full-size desktop class ESS 9038 Pro, dual yeah. uh, ESS 9038 Pro. And DACs. they didn't stop there. Yeah. They went with the amplifier circuit as well. Right. So like the R7, it's still based on the THX AAA 788 Plus. Yeah. But the R7 is an, uh, a four-channel. This is an eight-channel. So I believe the spec was it's 3,600 milliwatts or right thereabouts. Yeah. I'm with the R7, yeah. and it's like 7,300 milliwatts uh, into 32 ohms yeah. with the R9. Yeah. So practically double the power, and it shows. It does. It's it got has drive. tons of drive. Actually, the R7 had a lot of drive. This has nearly twice as much. Yeah. And it's also dead quiet. It is silent. Because it's the triple, the THX AAA 788 Plus dead quiet, like mm-hmm. analyzer class quiet. Yeah. And that means that, yeah, you have the drive to, to, to drive your hard-to-drive over ears, But when you have super sensitive Mm in-ears, you can plug them in and know, because there's several different gain settings as well, that it's going to be dead quiet. Yeah. That means something to me. It does. Yeah, because we have a lot of super sensitive in-ears here. We do. Um, Storage, it's also a desktop digital audio player. Yeah, it is. So you can use it as a desktop DAP. Yep. And And since it's a DAP, it's based on Android. Yeah. So I think right now it's Android 10, but they said Android 12 was coming at a later date. So we don't know when, but it is on the way. Yeah. So for me, for you, it's a multimedia Yep. device that you use as an audio and multimedia device. For me, I use it as a dedicated audio piece, a desktop, low, a small footprint desktop streamer. Yep. And DAC amp. Yeah. Love it. And even sometimes it's a little DAP. Totally dig it. And it looks cute on a desk. Ah, looks. I want to talk about that real quick because yeah. it does look different. So it has the LEDs, which you turn off. I do. Yeah. Um, I, maybe it's because I have a teenage son. I'm a little biased. <laughs> but he loves the way it looks on my desk. I yeah. love the way it looks on my desk. So I leave the LEDs on and you can change the colors. And then the shiny, there's a shiny part that I don't know that you can see in this shot. But Yeah, photos and, and video really don't do it justice. Right. But I'm going to say Fio calls it a classic metallic bicolor finish. It's a beautiful mirror shine. I honestly don't know what goes into it, but it, it's clearly going to take a lot of time. It's like an 11-step process, I think, is what they said. Seriously? So, yeah, so it takes like okay. 11 steps to make it look that way. So there's a depth to it. Yeah. That when yeah. you see it in person, you'll see. So just there really is. You, you'll have to clean it every once in a while because it's so glossy, but <laughs> it looks pretty when you do for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, at Fio's exhibit, if you're looking for desktop audio, unquestionably, look at the R7, the R9. You look at them both because there is a difference in price. Yeah. They're, they're sizable difference. Yeah. yeah. And make sure to check both out at Fio's exhibit. Now, two products arrived. And this is fun when this happens when something arrives that we kind of didn't know anything about. Yep. Uh, Hi Fi Man sent the EF 499 and EF 500. Yes, they did. When we, when we received them, there was really no inform- there was no information about them online. Yeah, they hadn't been announced. So, so kind of late in the process that we got them, like yep. in the shooting process, but we did get to spend some time with them. You more with the EF 499, right. me with the EF 500. But let's talk about what these are. Yes. These are DAC amps that are highly affordable mm-hmm. and they're R to R DACs. Yes, inside. they are. So I dig on that. So the EF500 is based on the Himalaya LE, mm-hmm. which is, and I'm a big fan so far of everything I've heard that uses Hi-Fi Man's, that they developed, their internally developed R2R architecture of this Himalaya R2R deck. And then the EF499 mm-hmm. is based on, not the Himalaya, but a Philips R2R deck architecture right. that they uh, that they mentioned that on HeadFi. Um, now, you've heard that they, they describe it as the Philips R2R dark, DAC architecture known for its naturally warm full-range Sonics. Fair enough? Yeah. Okay, you yeah. spent more time Well, because Hi-Fi Man says that it's remarkably close to that of Hi-Fi Man's reference Himalaya DACs. Yeah. And comparing it to the Himalayas that I have heard in the past, I can say that's in that vein. Yeah, okay, I agree. If it, Because I've only heard it briefly here. I haven't taken it home. Yeah. But the EF500 I have taken home. Yep. And that's how I would describe even that one. Yeah. Um, but I find them to be resolving R2R DACs. Oh, yeah. And that's the thing. If you're on in our community, a lot of people are 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 to our DAC enthusiasts. There seems mm-hmm. to be a growing contingent of them. Yeah. And I think those who haven't heard an R to R DAC yet might be curious. This is a pretty low risk way to do it. Yeah. I mean, sure. they're they're the price on the EF four ninety nine is two hundred ninety nine bucks. Yeah. The price on the EF five hundred is four hundred fifty nine bucks. Yeah. But if you're gonna be at Can Jam New York, then you can try, try them there. both. Yeah, while you're at the show. So if you're curious about that, as far as output power goes, four and a half watts in the 32 ohms with the EF 500 mm-hmm. and 4.35 watts in the 32 ohms. So pretty close Yeah, they're, with the EF yeah. 499. Um, definitely worth listening to. Oh, yeah. And I also, I want to also mention that it has two gain settings, mm-hmm. but also two DAC settings. Yes. So there's a high gain, non-oversampling, high gain, oversampling, low gain, oversampling, low gain, non-oversampling. Right. So you can play with non-oversampling and oversampling with just a flip of a switch in real time, which is nice to compare that mm-hmm. at two different gain levels. So yeah, this is a beautiful piece of kit, both of them. I agree. But 
for these prices, again, these are can't miss. They really Hi-Fi are. Man's exhibit in the desktop audio section. No question. Okay. Now there's something that I want to tell you will be there, but we haven't experienced ourselves yet, but it will be at CanJam New York for people to try. Audio-Technica is bringing their Narukami, the HPA KG Naru amplifier. This is a Summit Phi. When I say Summit Phi, I mean Summit Phi amplifier. Yeah, the price is... It's way up there. Way up there. It's a 300B tube amplifier. Yeah. We're going to put some specs on the screen right now just to give you an idea of what's inside of this thing. But really what jumps out to me is the wood. So it's called Kurogaki wood, which is a black persimmon. So persimmon doesn't really normally come in, in black, but they find persimmon wood with a black interior in the in the pattern and then they they finish it in the audio technica fashion like we've seen a lot, a lot of their headphones beautiful it, from the photos yeah. i want to try this out in person because it's one i'm never going to be able to afford but i want to try it yeah i i'm just excited because i love seeing more and more good tube amps i'm a huge tube amp enthusiast you're a 300b guy right i love 300b yeah 2a3 300b but anyways uh so i just am so excited that we're seeing more and more Two amps. This one, I can tell you right now, is completely out of my price range. <laughs> yeah. But I definitely want to hear it. Yeah. And as as far as the Kuragaki wood goes, the black persimmon wood. The photos look beautiful. The photos look beautiful. We haven't seen the amp in person. I've seen a Kuragaki headphone. Headphones, which we're going to talk yeah, about yeah. in the headphones. That part. was beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. So. so we'll talk about that. But I am looking forward to the Audio Technica HPA KG Naru. Naru. Yeah, okay. Now, the company Ferrum has become quite popular in the audiophile community at oh, large. Oh, yeah. And we've never had any Ferrum gear here, though, until very recently. No, but I have tried it at CanJam. So have I, and yeah. uh, also at Expona. Yes. But recently, Golden Sound, or Cameron, you guys know him as Golden Sound, the reviewer, and the measurer, the reviewer, he uh, contacted me via Head 5 PM to ask if I wanted to try something that he worked on with Ferrum called the Ferrum Wandla, which is their DAC. Yep. But the Golden Sound edition. Okay. So, of course, I want to hear this. I want to yeah. hear what, what what makes it the Golden Sound Edition. Well, he added some features to the Wandla mm -hmm. that I think are very, very compelling. Okay. So, the first one that I, that I think is the most important feature in there is the spatial enhancement. So, before I get into what spatial enhancement is, I want to first say that Cameron wanted to make sure not to make it a parlor trick. Okay. He wanted to offer something that... A lot of headphone listeners would consider an improvement. Now, I, I want to—I don't want to get too deep in the weeds here and get too distracted, but this is an interesting discussion for me because I'm old enough that I come from a different place than a lot of head fires. Like the average head fire is quite a bit younger than me. Sure. So I came from a world where I listened to speakers, loudspeakers, when I was a kid. Then growing up as an audiophile, listening to loudspeakers primarily. Mm -hmm. Then I got into headphones. And there were companies like Headroom. Remember Tile Hertzens of Interfidelity? He had a company called Headroom, and they developed a crossfeed circuit. Mm -hmm. And the idea of crossfeed, to, 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 to make it very simple, is when you're listening to loudspeakers, right? You have two loudspeakers in front of you. You have the left speaker and the right speaker. You, the right ear still hears the left loudspeaker, right? The, the, the left yeah. ear still hears the right loudspeaker. But then you put on headphones, and the right hears the right, left hears the left. Yep. So you don't get that cross feed that you get with speakers. I hope I'm being clear. Yeah. So for people who are used to listening to speakers, headphones could sound weird in mm -hmm. terms of imaging. But now we have this younger generation of head fires who, like my son, yep. who didn't really listen to speaker hi-fi. He's 19 years old. Uh, he's always been listening through headphones mm -hmm. or regrettably sometimes through his iPhone speakers, which drives me insane. I know, I know, sacrilege. But anyway, so, 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 he, and he, he, when I walk in the room, he turns it off because he knows it drives me nuts. <laughs> but, uh, so, so, but he listens through headphones and he's been listening through headphones from the start. So for him, there is no weirdness to solve. Headphone imaging is where it's at. Yeah, exactly. That's Normal. how he's listened. All right. So Cameron, I think, approaches this from that angle. He is also a loudspeaker guy, to be clear. Mm -hmm. he, is a, he is kind of like an anachronism because he's young, but he still loves like old audio sensibilities and things, including speakers. But what he did was he wanted to develop something that would make sense to somebody like my son and a lot of other head fires mm -hmm. who have always been listening through headphones that would improve spatial presentation sure. in a way that wasn't a parlor trick again and in a way that he's not trying to solve that speaker problem yeah. He's not trying to solve the speaker problem. He's trying to improve the headphone listening experience. Am I being clear? I yeah. hope I'm being clear. Yeah. Anyway, so that's what his spatial circuit is. And it doesn't sound like a parlor trick. And he uses the DSP 
inside the Ferrum Wandla to to accomplish this. Um, I, I won't get into the the specific details of it. I don't know that I have all the details of it anyway. Um, but I've talked a lot with Cameron about this, uh, both on the phone and typing. Here's what I'll say. So there's two different settings. There's speaker, mm-hmm. so and 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 headphone, and the speaker one is is less. You know, it has less of an effect to me with headphones than the than the than the headphone one. Okay. I guess that makes sense, right? Sure. Because the speakers are going to have anyway. So I haven't listened to it with speakers yet, just with the headphones. But with the headphones, I will say that it improves imaging with a lot of recordings. Mm-hmm. And it's not a parlor trick sound. It doesn't try to take it out of your head. So some DSP type settings try to take it, you know, other other types of processors try to remove it from your head. An admirable thing, an admirable thing to try to do. I get it. Yeah. But this just tries to improve the headphone listening experience. I, I hope I'm not being confusing here, but that's what Cameron's doing. It's worth a listen. So when you go to headphones.com's exhibit, look for the Ferrum Wandla Golden Sound Edition and try that. Okay. That's not the only thing it does. He has another thing called tube mode. I just said, I'm a big tube amp enthusiast. Yep. Love tube amps. I don't know what you can see in, in this. We set. got a couple. We have, yes, yeah, so we have tube amps all yeah. over the place. Love tube amps. And he has a tube amps uh, uh, mode. And, um, he describes it as this intentionally alters the distortion profile of the device and changes the sound to a presentation similar to that provided by tube DAX, making the sound richer, warmer, and providing increased tonal density, uh, to the timbre or timbre of vocals and instruments. Okay. He says this again is done entirely without any changes to frequency response. Oh, I did want to say that. So on the spatial part, going back to that just for a second, Mm -hmm. doesn't change the frequency response. Okay, that's impressive. Yeah, I've tested it. It doesn't. Okay, so then on the tube circuit, it also doesn't change the frequency response. Now, I will say the effect is more noticeable with some recordings. That goes for the spatial as well than others. Um, With the tube circuit, again, he doesn't want it to be a parlor trick. Mm -hmm. I would say that uh, switching it on, switching it off, the effect is more subtle. But... But but I love that where he's going with it. So again, something else that's not intended to be a parlor trick, that's intended to be. You know what it reminds me of? Remember when the Sony and WWM one Z Walkman had oh, the vinyl thing? Yes. So I was worried that when you clicked on vinyl, that maybe they would have like this repeating surface yeah. noise or something. No, they didn't do that, right? But right. I actually like the way that sounded. Anyways, I'm, I'm I'm I digress. So so I love the fact that he also has not done. Cameron did not do any parlor tricks mm-hmm. with this Wandla. And then he recently added in another firmware update that he just sent to us, a bass lift, sort of oh. a bass enhancement circuit. So up your alley. And I think, yeah, I mean, for well, depending on the headphone I'm listening to, right? It, yeah. can, it can be. Um, and uh, so that also was done, I would say, more subtly. And again, I love that he put these three features in, but not in a way that's parlor tricky. Mm-hmm. And I know I keep repeating that, but that's important because I think a lot of people think of DSP and changing things around is going to sound like weird audio trickery. He's actually doing the exact opposite. I would say they're more subtle and usable. Yep. So don't miss it. And okay, so aside from that, and the Wandla is just a really nice DAC, by the way. Yeah. Again, this is my first time to live with a Wandla in my system. Just as a DAC alone, when you switch off all the processing or put it back on, it's just really nice, period. So don't miss the Wandla, the Ferrum Wandla Golden Sound Edition. Which at is at headphones.com. Headphones.com's exhibit. Now, I love electrostatic headphones. A lot of headfires love electrostatic headphones. And at CanJam Dallas, there was a new electrostatic amplifier shown for the first time here in the States. It comes from Metaxas and Sins, and you know exactly where I'm going with I this do one. Yeah. But if the name Metaxas and Sins sounds familiar to you, it's because, most likely because of the marquee headphone amplifier that came a couple years ago. It was a skull shaped headphone, had a nice VU meter in each eye. It was a beautifully finished, very exquisitely designed amplifier. I think that has to be emphasized. Because when you say like a skull shaped oh, it's amplifier, be- it right, right, it's the like curvature. It, it oh. is, it is jarring. The machine, to see it. yeah, but the machine work is insane. It is, and they're coming out with a new one for electrostatics called the Ethereal. Now this is a full size, and when I say full size, I mean large, dual mono stacks bias electrostatic system. And if you're an endless tweaker, this is going to be the amplifier for you. This tweaker. is a, it's a tweaker amp. It's a, let's just say the volume knobs are placed in a rather precarious location. Yeah, rather he's being tongue cheek there. Yeah. Yeah. So, bit. so the volume knobs are, um, I'd say this is about right height. About the, the right the height. Volume knobs are the left and right are separate. They so are. you have to adjust them both independently. And Indep- well, yeah, at the same, <laughs> at the same time. Yep. And when you, when you see the amplifier, which again is exquisitely built to be clear. It, it is very well built. 
But they had to know. Oh, they, this... they couldn't not know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were a lot of pictures being taken with it. Oh. And I think yeah. anybody who sees it is going to at first say, electrostatic what? Because they're yeah. not going to be thinking electrostatic headphones when they see that thing. So it's it's essentially, I'm going to give it away. It's like a head and torso. Yeah, you know, yeah. it is. Um, like all the way down to the hips. Yes, very tall. Yeah, it's quite large. And then if you go fully kitted, uh, the skull portion of the headphone amplifier actually comes with a Torbjorn clock. Yeah, which is... It's, it's rather pretty. Yeah, it's very pretty. So make sure to stop by Metaxas, Metaxas and Sins and try out the Ethereal. I think a lot of headfires, when they think of desktop audio, hmm? for so many of them, the first company that'll come to mind is shit audio. I yeah. mean, that that's their entire model, effectively, right. is they make desktop audio products for headfires, like specifically. Yeah. Dedicatedly. And the community understandably loves them for it. And they make some wonderful products. They do. They're also one of the coolest stories ever to come through our community, just the way they've grown this company, making things that they know we want mm -hmm. and listening to the community and what they want, but also making some things that we didn't necessarily know we wanted. Yeah, before we knew we wanted. Yeah, yeah. Thing, and, yeah. Th and, then, and then people buy them. Yeah, for sure. And then, of course, Jason has the blog, Shit Happened. Yep. Oh, on, that's massive. Massive on HeadFi's forums. Certainly one of the most popular, if not the most popular, uh, threads on all of HeadFi, where it's essentially the ongoing story of shit audio. Yeah. Um, anecdotes, you know, successes, failure. I, honestly, it's brilliant. Yeah, and he updates it frequently. He updates it frequently, and he's a writer, uh, like an accomplished writer, to be clear, and it comes through. Anyway. That's all aside. I want the, 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 what I want to talk about is the shit audio midguard. Yep. So the shit audio midguard, they make a lot of stuff. Listen to their stuff again. That's their model. Is they make desktop audio gear for head fires, mm -hmm. dedicated at every price point. At every price point, but nothing like crazy, crazy though. That's true. Yeah. So so, but the midguard, which is right here, this little amp over here, in my opinion, is maybe uh, certainly one of, if not the best value, maybe any things. Mm -hmm. In all of HeadFi right now, really, that I I genuinely believe that. So I might have mentioned it in the, the previous preview video, like Dallas. I'm not even sure, but we had but, just gotten it around that time. Yeah, but now I spent a lot of time with it. Yeah. So what is it? So it's a balanced headphone amp and preamp. I think I think the way we have it configured, it's like 220 bucks. I think so. It's dead quiet with sensitive in ears. So I mean, they tell you straight up, you can drive anything with it, mm -hmm. um, and you can. But it also has 4.8 watts RMS into 32 ohms, so it'll drive most over ears with joy. Mm -hmm. But again, dead quiet, so you can plug super sensitive in-ears into it. And it's designed and built at Shit Audio's new Texas facility. Yep. And I think, again, as ours is configured, I think it's 220 bucks, which is incredible. Now, it uses something called Shit Audio's Halo topology, mm -hmm. and I'm going to go to Jason's words to describe it. So the Midgard is simply the best measuring, highest power discrete headphone amp we've ever made, but that's not all. Midgard's new Halo topology also offers the potential for higher performance where it matters at your ears. This is where it gets interesting. Halo, a mixed mode feedback topology that incorporates your headphone driver into the feedback loop, offering the potential for better control at driver resonance and improved acoustic results. Now, I want to be clear, that's only on the balanced output, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is yes. only balanced. Because there's a balanced and and, yes. and and then unbalanced output. It's only on the balanced output that Halo right. exists. And then they say, if, and I, is this still current, by the way, this last part in your notes? If you have an oh, acoustic yeah. measurement rig and want to publish your results, positive or negative, contact them and they'll get you a mid-guard to measure. I believe that's still current. Okay, if that's still current, they're not talking like if you have a multimeter, you know, right. plug it in. They, they want, a, I think, someone that has like a, a, a proper suite, a proper yeah measurement setup. So if you do, contact them, get a mid-guard. But if you don't, buy one. I'm not kidding. Because at 220 bucks, it's, to me, one of the biggest no-brainers And again, all of head fi anythings it's that great a value so when you go to shit audio's exhibit make sure to check out everything because they have so much stuff to check out yeah. i want to check out i think want to check out some other eqs because i still have only the yes. first file but but make the midgard the very first thing you check out it's an incredible value now earlier you mentioned that viva audio is one of our can jam new york sponsors this year so of course they'll be exhibiting at the show and they'll be showing off their egoista 845 headphone amplifier now, if you've been to a can jam in the past or you've seen photos from the show, I'm sure you've noticed this amplifier sitting there. It's very pretty, very attractive. The The finish is lovely on it. Gorgeous. And there's always a cue, so it draws the eye. Yeah. But the Egoista 845 is a zero negative feedback, pure class A tube amplifier. And for you tube guys out there, here's your tube complement. It's a single 6N1P, a single 6SN7 GTP, dual 845s, and dual EH5U4GB tubes. They're 
845s on that amp right there. Those big tubes are 845s. There you go. I forgot that was back there. Yeah. Now, this is a headphone amplifier through and through. If you know their line, they manufacture other products for dual mono systems, for preamplifiers. But this is specifically for headphones to the point that they have a custom design transformer. They say it's specifically designed for exclusive use with headphones. So yes. it is only for headphones. That's it. Purpose built. And the, the the number of inputs and outputs on this is it's rather interesting. It's got dual XLR mono, two quarter inch headphone outputs, and two four pin XLR outputs on the front. And then you got your standard on for them four source inputs and one direct input bypassing the preamp stage. So it, it's a really well thought out design. I agree. I, I want to hear it because again, I'm a huge tube amp enthusiast. Yep. And this is just an amp I've not spent any time with. Yeah. Now at CanJam SoCal, it was paired with a really cool reel to reel system. So I hope it's back again. But whether it's there or not, you need to stop by Viva Audio's exhibit at CanJam New York. Whenever Benchmark Media Systems is exhibiting at one of our shows, I get so excited because, yeah. as you know, here at HeadFi HQ, their products remain among our high references. Right. Like literally. So the DAC3 HDC, we both use it a lot, is a wonderful DAC. And mm -hmm. it's been around a while, so I think it gets forgotten sometimes. because it we're, does. We're, I think a lot of the people in the community, we're looking for new all the time. And since that's been out for a while, maybe it gets ignored. Right. But at its price, I think you have to consider it. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful sounding DAC. Technically, it's incredible as well. If you're into measurements, yeah. you'll be happy there too. Um, they make other models with and without the amp circuit, I believe, the headphone amp circuit. They do. So you can save a little money. Mm -hmm. But audition the DAC 3 HGC. Here, it's still one of our reference DACs. Now, the HPA4, yes. which is their headphone amplifier, I'm really excited about. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a bittersweet story for us because we love it yeah. so much as a lab amp. Right. So in our measurement lab, we use the HPA4. So THX built, built us a Unity Gain custom built that they built for us for our mm -hmm. lab um, headphone amplifier based on THX AAA triple eight circuit. Right. But Benchmark's HPA4 is also built on the AAA triple eight circuit. And it has adjustable gain. Yeah. <laughs> so it, with one of the most genius volume controls, in my opinion, ever invented. Mm -hmm. They did, I think they did a whole white paper on that volume they control. Did. Speaking of white papers, John Seow, the guy who designs Benchmark stuff, genius. He is, uh, he just doesn't know it because he doesn't know me. Uh, I don't think he knows who I am. But John Seow is one of my measurement mentors just based on the stuff he writes, the information yeah. he puts out his white papers, his tech notes. So anyway, check out their website. He has some great stuff. But check out the Benchmark DAC3 and mm -hmm. its various forms, which I think they'll have at their exhibit for sure, and the HPA4. The HPA4, we love the way it sounds, but yes. now it's pretty much stuck in our lab doing measurement lab things, right. which is great and kind of bittersweet because we don't listen to it as much. But anyway, don't miss Benchmark stuff. Now, I've made abundantly clear by now uh, probably too clear that I am a tube amp audio enthusiast. You have. And so of all the amps, not just on this table, but of all the amps I know of that'll be at CanJam New York 2024, one of the ones, if not the one I'm most excited about because I've heard it, yeah. is that tube amp, that ginormous tube amp that dominates that end of the table over there. That's yep. the ZMF headphones, ZMF Aegis. Now, it's based on DIY designs from... Keenan McKnight, who goes right. by Lord Gwynn on HeadFi's forums, and I believe on other forums as well. He does. This is a single-ended tube amplifier. It is just a pure tube amplifier. Mm -hmm. No silicon in the circuit. It's an old-school tube amplifier design featuring Lundahl transformers and chokes. The tube complement, one 5AR4 rectifier, two 6SL7 input tubes, two EL34 outputs, output tubes. Now, as compatibility goes for the rectifier, you can use GZ34, 5AR4, which that has, uh, 5B4, GZ32, 5R4, 274B. For the inputs, it is 6SL7. For uh, for the output, you can use 6V6, 6L6, EL34, EL37, KT66, KT77, KT8865, 50. Okay, fine. Of the tubes I already said it has, mm -hmm. whatever's in it, this one just sounds incredible. I would still like to tube roll with it someday, but sure. I don't know. I'm so happy with the way this one sounds now mm -hmm. with everything I plug into it. So what do I love about it so much? It sounds like everything I want a tube amp to be. So it sounds to me very resolving as yeah. tube amps go or as amps go. Yes, I know. There's a whole discussion to have about measurements and tube amps and everything else. Fine. I measure too. We have a measurement lab here. Yep. Whatever. So it's a very resolving amp to me. Yeah. But it also is harmonically rich. And it has just holographic imaging. It's very 
it's uh, what's the word like a, a like the it has body mm. like corporeal right it's as if flesh and blood right i love that and so why i'm excited about it is because i know how it sounds yep and for people that are curious about what a good tube amp sounds like i know i can say here's one right that you want to listen to it can jam new york 2024 just go to zmf headphones exhibit listen to the ages yeah i can see why the guys in the thread that are building them and are you know nuts about what they're hearing mm -hmm. and then they're tube rolling and having fun with that i get it i get why but for someone that just wants to know what a great tube amp sounds like now you can listen to this one yep. and then you'll know why i'm so excited i know i've hogged it you have i've totally hogged it so you've like hardly heard it so there you go you should listen to it too <laughs> um if you don't get a chance to listen to it here listen to it at can jam but yeah this is an incredible amp the zmf aegis great job guys to zmf and to lord Gwyn to keenan yeah so while you're at ZMF Headphones Exhibit, Brian, and I say Brian because this is another one I've hogged, so you yeah. hardly had a chance to listen to it, so you might have to go there to listen to it, uh, is uh, you got to listen to the homage. Yeah. So this is the ZMF homage. It's a it's a headphone amplifier that's a collaboration between JDS, JDS Labs and ZMF Headphones. Mm -hmm. And when you say those two, if you know anything about those two companies, or if you know a lot about those two companies, and I do... You know, if, if thinking of them collaborating on a product at first doesn't really make sense. And then they do it. And then you realize it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Right. So on the one hand, you have a very engineering focused company and their stuff really measures. Fantastic. JDS mm -hmm. Labs. And and we've had great experiences with their products. Yeah. With a few we've had here. So I enjoy them. Mm -hmm. I agree. On the other side, you have ZMF headphones. Mm -hmm. They're also very engineering focused. I mean, their labs are incredible. But they're also very driven by this what we want it to sound like yes. sort of philosophy. Yes, they are. So example, I don't think any JDS Labs amps have an output impedance switcher, right? Because I don't think so. I can't think of any. Because I would guess that John Sieber would say like, well, you'd want output impedance to be low all the time, as low as possible all the time. Right. I can totally get that. But that one has a switch, 0 0.7 yep. ohms, 47 ohms. That seems like a very ZMF thing to me, like... Okay, with a multi-driver in-ear, and that thing is quiet enough that you can use a sensitive multi-driver in-ear with it. But for that, you'd want to go the low output impedance sure. for sure. But with your over-ear headphones, play with it. Yep. That's a ZMF thing. That's a ZMF philosophy to me, right? That's like, play with it. See which sounds better to you. That is so cool that yep. they did that. It has 2.2 watts per channel into 32 ohms. And it does it quiet, very quietly in terms of self-noise. Yep. I mean, it's, I would guess... I haven't measured it yet, but I would guess with JDS working on it as well, that it's going to be as quiet as their other stuff, which is about as quiet as an audio analyzer. Sure. Because I, pl I plugged in sensitive in-ears into it, no problem. Now, it has three gain settings. Mm -hmm. That adds to the flexibility. Perhaps one of the more important features to me is the VU meter on the front. Oh, of course. Yes, we are both suckers for a VU meter. Yes, we are. Um, and it has a design that maybe John would have to explain or Zach would explain. It, it, they call it a balance to single ended input design. I'm not going to venture to try to explain that because I can't. But it sounds beautiful, by the way. Yeah. Uh, inputs RCA and XLR. Outputs XLR and 4.4 millimeter Pentacon. And there's an Alps 27 millimeter potentiometer uh, for the volume control. Yep. Which I love the knob on it. It is very cool. It goes over the into the top of the unit. And you can adjust it by sliding that or turning the knob. And the feel on that knob is incredible. So I don't know if you remember, there was an audio reviewer on YouTube. I don't know if he's still around. Anybody remember knob feel? Oh, yeah. So knob feel, I don't know who it was actually to this day. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't know if his identity was ever revealed. But he would literally um, review just the way the knob felt on various yep. pieces of audio gear. So, so you'd see his hand turn the knob. And then if it didn't feel good, he might go like, huh? But you didn't see his face, right? right you know, yeah. you'd just hear, uh, uh, right? But if it felt good, he'd be like, ooh. Mm. <laughs> and I think when he turned the knob on, if he yeah. turned the knob on that one, I think he'd be like, mm, for sure. Because it feels good. Yeah. So again, JDS, ZMF, maybe it doesn't make sense at first, totally makes sense in, in practice. Do not miss the homage. I say that to you too, Brian, because I've stolen <laughs> the sample so many times that you haven't had a chance to listen to it. Don't miss the homage. Now, I'd say in the last couple of years, one of the most dominant desktop systems in terms of performance, in terms of, well, it's also physically imposing, yep. has been the DCS Lena. 
their stack, which is the headphone amplifier. I'm doing it in order that we stack it. Headphone yep. amplifier, master clock, uh, network DAC. Yep. And it's a very high end system. This is you know, and as far as head fires go, I'd say this is Summit Five stuff. Sure. So this is probably helped along by the fact that at their shows they put on one of the best exhibits that we've ever seen at any Can Jam whenever they're there. Yeah, they do. Because they have already what is a quieter room than the main show floor by mm -hmm. a long shot. And then at each listening station, they have even more isolation. And at each listening station, they usually have at least a Lena stack, which is incredible. And then sometimes even some of their higher end stuff. Right. At each listening station, they also have usually a slew of high end headphones. And it is the closest in terms of environment. Like when you when you do sit down at their exhibit to listen, it's the closest I think we get at a can jam to what it's like to be at home. Yep. Listening to a system or at work. If you work at HeadFi, like we do, yeah, because <laughs> we do that a lot here. But it's kind of like an escape. Yeah, it is, and um, and the Linus stack is just an incredible thing. Anyway, um, we have here. We didn't have room for the whole stack today because right. of all the other gear we have here. So I put the Lena amp mm -hmm. up, um, just because I think since DCS is really known more for their DACs, maybe it goes a little overshadowed. Maybe overshadowed a bit. Yeah, but I honestly, it performs way above its specs. Yeah, so give it a listen. But give the whole stack a listen. But the big news, I think, was the firmware 2.0 update mm -hmm. that really brought many of the features and performance features of the Lena network DAC to in the realm of like their their more flagship stuff, their higher end stuff. Right. Yes. Believe it or not, the Lena stuff, which is Super Summit 5 for head fires, is not the top of the line for no. DCS. <laughs> um, but 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 firmware 2.0 really kind of gets it closer to that. Mm -hmm. uh, with new mapper settings that you only saw before in their Vivaldi, Rossini, and Bartok ranges. Right. Now you have that in the Lena 2, uh, with mm -hmm. Lena 2.0. DSD-128 upsampling. I won't go over all these new PCM and DSD filters, balance controls. Anyway, definitely go to DCS's exhibit if you haven't already done that, or even if you have, just to be able to chill and listen to an incredible system, one of our reference systems here at HeadFi HQ. And just that's to me their 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 exhibit is kind of what can jam. I wish I wish every can jam exhibit could be, but of course that would not be really possible. Yeah. So don't miss DCS's exhibit at Can Jam New York 2024. At Can Jam New York this year, our seminar schedule is completely packed. There are a total of 11 seminar sessions over the two days. I should also mention that none of the seminars are repeated and they can fill up quickly. So plan your schedule accordingly to see the ones you want to see and get there a little early to secure a seat. Okay, now this is important, very important, especially if you've been to Can Jam New York before. This year, the seminars will take place in a new location. They'll be held in the Ziegfeld Room on the fourth floor, which is two floors below the main exhibit area. So again, the seminars are in a new location on the fourth floor in the Ziegfeld Room. Hey, I'm Jacob Sundergaard from Head Acoustics, and I'll be presenting a seminar at CanJam New York with Michael Ricci from XMEMS. The title of our talk is It's About Time, What New Measurements Reveal About Audio Quality. This will be Saturday, March 9, 2024, from 11 a.m. to noon. Recent advancements in microspeaker design and men's fabrication have resulted in a new class of transducer that deliver the highest precision audio reproduction in the time domain. But why is this important and how are we going to evaluate them accurately? Head Acoustics and XMEMS will present test and measurement results of XMEMS new Piezo MEMS microspeakers. This benchmark testing was conducted by Head Acoustics at our North American labs in Michigan, where we measured XMEMS IEM reference platforms as well as newly released commercial products using Piezo MEMS microspeakers. I will break down MDAX, which is based on six years of cutting-edge research on human hearing and audio perception, and Michael will discuss how MDAX results are validating the praises of golden ears from around the world, which traditional audio testing methods cannot reveal. Continuing the Saturday seminar schedule is a panel titled Myths About Measurements from noon to 1 p.m. This panel is presented by Constantine Davey, acoustic engineer at USound, and Blaine LaCrosse and Cameron Oatley, both of Headphones.com. Respectively, you may know these gentlemen better as Oratory 1990, Matt Economist, and Golden Sound. Objective measurements are everywhere in audio. Never before has so much data been so accessible so easily, but is that a good thing? 
join their panel of experts to learn why measurements shouldn't always be trusted, why we should always take measurements with a sizable grain of salt, why we should never treat them as absolutes, and how objective measurements are often quite subjective. Most importantly, learn about what's being done to address these flaws to achieve better clarity for us all moving forward. On Saturday from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m., Jason Stoddard, founder of Shit Audio, will be presenting a talk titled Going Beyond One Number to Rule Them, Measurements in Perspective. Shit Audio's history with measurements includes being called lazy and competent engineers, buying not one but 11 audio analyzers, and then designing both spectacularly measuring gear and stuff that's downright scary bad. Are they crazy, or is it possible that a single reductive number just can't reflect actual listening levels, transient response, or the distortion of transducers? So how do they measure more, measure better, actually measure effectively, and then make that something meaningful to give us genuine perspectives on how things sound? Let's find some answers. Saturday from 3 to 4 p.m., Rob Watts, digital design consultant for Court Electronics, will be giving a talk titled Digital Isn't. Digital is digital, it's all ones and zeros, except that no, it isn't. Beyond the fundamentals of the digital to analog conversion process, there are a host of additional factors that can dramatically affect the sound of your DAC and consequently what you will hear through your signal chain. Discover how the power supplies, analog devices and circuit design, galvanic isolation, digital cables, and more can dictate your listening experience. But most importantly, learn how sometimes digital isn't. On Saturday from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m., Tal Kosen, co-founder and COO of Deconi Audio, will be giving a seminar titled Ear Pads as Critical Acoustical Devices. Many head fires view ear pads as simple replacement parts and nothing more. And whilst they are undoubtedly consumables, ear pads are also coupling devices that form part of the complex acoustic chamber between your headphones and your ears. As such, their mechanical and material properties can dramatically affect what you hear. Join Tal to explore how ear pads can preserve or even perfect the sound signatures of your favorite headphones. Closing out our Saturday seminars, come join Zach and Bevan Merbach from ZMF Headphones for a seminar they're hosting titled How to Start a Headphone Company from 5 to 6 p.m. Zach and Bevan Merbach's entry into the headphone industry was unconventional. They'll share their business journey, including anecdotes and images from their early days to the present, covering multiple measurement rig upgrades, various workspaces from apartments to basements, and the design of an 8,000 square foot manufacturing facility. Join Bevan and Zach for a fun time, and be sure to bring your questions. Now on Sunday, March 10th, from 11 a.m. to noon, Dr. Sean Olive, Senior Fellow Acoustic Research at Harman International, will give a talk titled, New Headphone Target Curves Defined on the B&K 5128. How different do they sound, and which one is most preferred? The release of the Care 5128 head and torso simulator in 2018 ushered in a new standard in accurate measurements of headphones. Its introduction also meant that headphone target curves defined on the older standard were no longer valid when measured on the 5128. Since then, several different headphone target curves for the 5128 have been proposed, but most lack scientific validation based on controlled listening tests. This raises an important question. How different do they sound from one another, and which one is most preferred? Dr. Olive's talk will give an overview of the various headphone target curves proposed and how they were derived, and some analysis of how different they sound from one another. On Sunday from noon to 1 p.m., Dan Foley of Do No Harm Music, and Dan's also one of my measurement mentors and previously from Audio Precision, Dan will present a talk titled A Novel Approach to Measure Headphone Transient Response. The Farina logarithmic sweep test method in use since 2000 enables engineers designing electroacoustic products to obtain a device's impulse response from a constant amplitude sinusoidal sweep. Due to the non-transient nature of this stimulus, this impulse response may differ from a response generated when using a transient stimulus. This presentation discusses how one can characterize transient behavior of headphones using single-cycle tone bursts to augment measurements obtained through sign-based testing. On Sunday from 2 to 3 p.m., Modi Margalit, CEO of Sonic Edge Limited, will be giving a talk titled, Making Great Sound from Thin Air. What if we told you that the perfect membrane can be made from air? Learn how they engineer solid-state air drivers using modulated ultrasound, delivering exceptional bass from compact speakers while reproducing highs flawlessly. Explore their current applications and the transformative potential they hold for the future of audio. Join Modi to unravel the magic of air drivers and their groundbreaking impact. On Sunday from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m., Rob Watts will be back with another talk titled Critical Listening, How to Judge. Many designers use listening tests to improve the design of their products. 
But since the provenance of recordings is unknown, how can one be sure that genuine improvements are being made so that real progress towards transparent reproduction is being achieved? It's very easy to think that an improvement is actually better when it's worse. Objectively assessing sound quality is key, and this seminar will explain how. This will be followed by a Q&A session when you can ask any question about digital audio. And finally, bringing the CanJam New York seminar sessions to a close, there will be a discussion panel simply titled Ask the Reviewers AMA at CanJam New York 2024 from 4 to 5 p.m. What was best in show at CanJam New York 2024? Is there a correct sound signature and what might that be? How much power do we actually need to truly drive our headphones? What is the best in your monitor or headphone for my music within my budget? You have questions, bring them all to this panel of experts as they answer them live and in real time. This panel of reviewers will include Critical, DMS, Golden Sound, Resolve, Zeos Pantera, and this panel will have a special guest moderator, Zach Merbach of ZMF Headphones. Again, these seminars can fill up quickly, so plan your schedule accordingly to see the ones you want to see and get there a little early to secure a seat. Keep in mind that this year, the seminars will take place in a new location, the Ziegfeld Room, on the fourth floor, which is two floors below the main exhibit area. Now, earlier you were saying that you felt like there was a resurgence in desktop gear, and I don't disagree, but portable is still booming, specifically in-ears. Yeah. I mean, there's so many. Unquestionably, yeah. So when I said that there's a resurgence in... Uh, the desktop head fi gear mm -hmm. of that there is no doubt to me yeah but it's certainly not at the expense of any other category like the portable stuff right um it, it kind of just seems like everything is growing but really unquestionably where i'd say the most exciting segment where where the most new product releases most often are happening is iems yep so that's the category we're going to be talking about now um, and we have a lot to get through. We do. Because there are a lot of new things that are going to be at CanJam, a lot of existing things in mm -hmm. terms of IEMs at CanJam, a lot to listen to. So we have a small sampling here, yeah. but still a lot to get through for a preview video. Right. So let's get to it. Let's start with Campfire Audio's Fathom. Great place to start. Yes, because I think that is, at least as of the shooting time, like right now, that has not been announced on the forums or anywhere else. It has not currently, and I think the announcement is right around the time we're expecting, hopefully, to have this video up. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, if we stay yeah. on schedule. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so the Fathom, then, might very well be brand new to you, something you've never heard of. So the Campfire Audio Fathom, we both really enjoyed a lot. So this one they describe, if I may say, they say, the goal of Fathom's design is to provide a sound that is true to the original recording, allowing you to hear your music with clarity and depth. Yeah. I would say that's accurate. I'd say so. I'd say it's fair. Yes. Now, the one thing I wouldn't say, though, is that it, it to me, it doesn't sound like a studio monitor, per se. No, it does not. And I don't think that it needs to be a studio monitor to be uh, to fit that description. No, yeah. I would say it's a bit maybe more laid back than I would expect a studio monitor would be. Sure. But yet in a way that I found very enjoyable. Mm -hmm. So when I first heard it, you know, we've, we've said this so many times on these preview videos and other videos that I hope people not by now know. You tend to prefer things with a little bit more treble energy than me, maybe a little less right. bass than I do. Yeah. I tend to prefer things that are maybe a little smoother up top than you prefer mm -hmm. with maybe a little more bass than you do. Yeah. Um, this is one of those ones, you know, it doesn't happen that often that when you ask me what I think of it, I ask you what you think of it, and we're both, like, super enthusiastic about it. Yep. So this one happened. This it did. All right. So I thought that you might find it when I first heard it uh, a little bit um, too smooth at the top, but I you can, didn't. I can see why you might, yeah. Yeah, but you didn't. No. And so that's the one thing, though, is when you listen to it, it's not fatiguing. Correct. But it's also not smoothed over in terms of resolution. Right. So I find it very resolving, um, and so did you. Yeah. This is one of those in-ears that, for me, I can listen to for hours, and in fact, I did. Yeah. Um, as I'm shooting photography and processing for these preview videos i'm usually listening to gear i spent a lot of time listening with the fathom and it was just a great partner through hours of photographs all right yeah let's talk about which drivers are in it okay so it's a multi-ba design um it has dual custom high definition super tweeters two mid-range drivers and dual custom ba woofers so it's an all it. ba design all ba design okay it's got a really cool housing uh they call it a black anodized bright dipped finish it's a machined aluminum shell on the inside but that finish it just looks Kind of like a void. I love I love the way it turned out. It's a beautiful design. But it also too. has a really cool feature on the accents. Prismatic rainbow PVD stainless steel on the fasteners and MMCX connections. So the way they do that is, you know, so unique 
it, it has a really kind of kind of a mood ringy vibe to it to me but at the same time i love the look and it's going to be unique every single one of these is going to look all its own. No, I did not know. Yep, one of, one of a kind each. Okay, very cool. Yeah. So that is the Fathom retails. We didn't mention it. Uh, uh, ten forty nine. Thousand forty nine dollars. Pre orders start in April, and you can try them at Can Jam New York. Yep. Two other in ears at Campfire Audio's exhibit. I want to quickly mention. Okay. Uh, for a reason very specific, they're MDAC scores. Ah, uh, yes. So okay. multi dimensional audio quality score from Head Acoustics. Yeah. We've been doing this now, using it for I think a couple of years. Mm-hmm. We started using it when it was in kind of prototype form when they were still finishing up development yeah and been using it ever since uh we're not alone correct S- sound guys recently announced they're also using it they are i think more viewers will be using it companies are certainly going to be picking up on oh, it. i know companies are yeah. yes they are already using it yeah. i think and we'll be using it to evaluate human perception of the audio quality of their devices mm-hmm. increasingly going forward yeah okay we just did a primer like a sort of introductory video of mdax with jacob sondergaard from head acoustics yeah so we just released that like this week. It was recent. So yeah. so so maybe pause this video, watch it if you're interested. If you if, if you haven't watched anything else we've done on MDAX. Mm-hmm. Um prior to this one, like I think it was last year sometime, we interviewed Hans Gerlich, Dr. Good. Hans Gerlich from Head Acoustics. That was a deeper dive. Yes. But you know, if you like kind of a more technical discussion, watch that one. We'll be talking about it more and more. We'll be including MDAX scores along with frequency response measurements in a mm-hmm. tool we're developing for the website. I know we're behind schedule on that, but we're gonna get to that. So let's talk about MDAX and a couple of the uh, the, the campfire pieces that I, I measured. Um, mostly because I liked the way they sounded, so I, yeah. I wanted to measure them. Um, so the first one, we'll go with the Superman. Sure. That's uh, that's the planar magnetic one. 14 millimeter planar magnetic, I think. Yeah. One, one per side, right? Yeah. So that one, I think, starts at uh, 1000 Yeah, $1,099. Yeah. All right, so here's how that one scored. So it's... MDAX, its multi-dimensional audio quality score, overall score, MOS O, mm-hmm. was 4.8. Okay. Very high. Very Highest nice. is 5. Uh, its timbre score, which encompasses tonal balance, 4.8. Still so again, nice. Yeah, out of 5. Yeah. Um, that didn't surprise me. Uh, with MDAX, you know, I sometimes at the top of its base range, it likes things that are basier than me it, it can yeah yeah uh, basier than me basier than i prefer um the super moon i would say is kind of at the top of where i listen bass wise i see that yeah probably too high for you then it is yeah and uh but i liked its overall signature a lot and i like the way it images mm-hmm. so let's talk about immersiveness 4.5 okay so 4.5 is actually very high so far in the things that we've evaluated with mdax right so that didn't surprise me either so if you want to hear a nice, rich-sounding IEM that killed on MDAX, mm-hmm. Campfire Audio Supermoon. Okay, bigger story, though, maybe, for me anyway, is the Cascara. All right. The Campfire Audio Cascara is $499. Yes, it is. Now, earlier I said in the desktop section, I called out a specific amp. It was the Shit Audio Midgard. Midgard. Yeah. Said it was maybe the one of the best value anythings in all of HeadFi. All right. The Cascara is also in that category. It's one of the best value anythings in all of HeadFi. Not right. because of its MDAX score. Yeah. I just think it sounds great. It does. For $499, mm-hmm. that uses... Uh, 10 millimeter dynamic, I think. So one dynamic driver per side. Yeah. Again, it's $499. Yeah. I love its tonal balance. More in my wheelhouse, I would say, in, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of overall balance than the Superman. Yep. I love the way it images. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to measure it, to see how it scored on immersiveness. Yeah. All right. So did I already say how it scored? 4.8 on timbre. Yep. So... Supermoon was 4.8. Important thing, and this is one of the coolest things about MDAX, you know, two things that score the same, even on timbre, for example, don't necessarily sound alike. Right. Okay. Uh, so 4.8 on timbre for the Cascara. Mm-hmm. Immersiveness, 4.8. One of the highest wow. we've ever seen for immersiveness. Very nice. And I love the way it images. Overall score, if I didn't already say, is 4.8, 4.8 yeah. as well. So it killed. Yeah. Those scores also didn't surprise me. So again, one of the best value anythings in all of HeadFi, the Campfire Audio Cascara. Mm-hmm. Listen to it at their exhibit. Listen to all their IEMs for sure. But I'd give those two a, a listen just if you're interested in MDAX. You know they scored very high, and they don't sound exactly like it. They scored pretty much the same. Yeah, that's what's kind of cool about MDAX. Now, Astel and Kern, with its collaboration in ears, has been just firing on all cylinders. They've yeah, had they some great collaboration they pieces. Did. Last year. One of my favorite in-ears was one of their collaboration pieces with Visioneers called The Aura. Yep. Okay, that's all sold out. I'm not going to talk about that one right now. But I do regret not picking one up. But anyways, now this year, don't think it's been announced yet, 
as of the time of the shooting, the Astel and Kern Empire Ears Novus. Yes. This thing is striking in every possible way. I don't want to start with its looks. For most things, I don't like starting with looks. I have to for we this one. Have to. So this one looks super stunning. It does. So it has this bezel on the outside on the faceplate hmm? that reminds me, I don't know why, it reminds me a little bit of a, like a porthole on an old ship. I can see that, yeah. And then it has the gold-plated logos. Yep. Again, very striking. Uh, oh, the, and the gold-plated is 24-karat wet gold faceplate top and base. Yeah, I think that's an application process. Yeah, I don't yeah. know what gold means. Is that what it means? I think so. And what I really totally dig, the sapphire crystal. Yes. So the faceplate has sapphire crystal mm -hmm. over it. Sapphire glass. That's just brilliant. It is. And it all comes together to look absolutely like it is so eye-catching. Yeah. In a way that I find absolutely beautiful. Yeah. But the funny thing is the aura, you know, the one they did that I mentioned earlier mm -hmm. with, with Visioneers, that one was much more understated. And yeah, more still, classy. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and beautiful in its way. This is beautiful in this just really striking, yes. check it out kind of way. Yeah. I, I dig it. So, but let's talk about what's inside because we love the way it sounds. Yeah. I love the way it sounds probably a little more than you do. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I can see that. But uh, thankfully, it's not just skin deep, I'll be honest. It's a quad bridge design. Right. So they've done some really cool stuff inside here. I'm going to cheat a little bit. They've got four Sonian electrostatic drivers, one Sonian balanced armature driver, four proprietary Nova drivers developed by Knowles, two of Empire Ears' W9 dynamic driver, or W9 plus, I'm sorry, dynamic drivers, and two Sonian bone conduction drivers inside. The reason why it's impressive to me is they've done such a nice job marrying those together. Yeah. It, it feels seamless. It does. Not easy to do. No. I think I, I, I was trying to keep count. There's like four different kinds of drivers. It's, it's a quad bridge, yeah. So trying to get even two different types of drivers to sound as one yeah. can be tricky. Getting the timbre to just match up and mm -hmm. sound as one. To do it with four different types is, I'm sure, very, very challenging. But yeah. they did it, and I do love the way it sounds. So for me, it's on the higher side of what I find like on the rich side of my wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. But within it, love it. It's very resolving. Yes. It's it's generally, in my opinion, quite balanced. I mean, for you, you might find that bass a yeah, little bit it, higher it, than it throws you. the balance off for me personally, but yeah. I mean a lot of guys are gonna love the signature. Oh my gosh. I think this is gonna go over gangbusters. Yeah. So it does with me. So it also images beautifully. It does. Which is you know, yeah, that can be challenging to make four types of drivers, what is it, thirteen total drivers? Thirteen, yeah. Image coherently. Yeah. So let's talk about its MDAC score, just because right. I was so curious to know how it would do. So looking at its MDAC score, uh, it, in terms of timbre, it actually killed. 4.9. So it's Moss team, mean opinion score, timbre. Yeah. was 4.9 out of 5. That is seriously impressive. We, we, we haven't had many 4.9s I've seen. No, haven't had many 4.9s. And in terms of immersiveness, this also didn't surprise me, 4.8. Nice. So um, also one of the highest we've seen for, for immersiveness. Mm -hmm. So it just killed. Yeah. So as flagship in-ears go... Once again, Astle and Kern with their collaboration. This time it's the Astle and Kern Empire Ears Novus. Mm -hmm. An absolute can't miss flagship in-ear. And yeah, go to Astle and Kern's exhibit. Don't miss the Novus. Now we've talked about a couple of in-ears that are more your wheelhouse than mine. So I want to take a second, be a little greedy here, talk about something that's more in my range. It's a collaboration piece between Dunu, Headphones.com, and Precogvision, who a lot of people know from his reviews on the uh, Headphones.com forums. And I think his own YouTube channel, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not sure. But yeah, but I mean, I his real name is Theo. Yeah. And I tend to call all those guys with their nicknames by their real names when I know it, uh, maybe because I'm an old man. Yeah. But yeah, so Precogvision is a well-known reviewer. And yeah, this was a collaboration piece with him. I think he voiced it. Yeah, they all came together and voiced this, which is the Dunu Mirai. It's the green piece that I have down here. Little nice creamy cable going with it. Beautiful sounding piece. But let's start with the interior. It's a 10 millimeter dynamic driver, single. Dual Sonian mid-range dual BA drivers, one Noel's mid-high BA driver, two Noel's dual tweeter BA drivers, and one Noel's open back BA super tweeter. Well, that yeah. is a lot. I didn't do the count. <laughs> it's huge. Yeah. So this is kind of like neutral fun to me in a way, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's one of those things where, <clears throat> like the Fathom earlier, I can listen to that for hours. I can listen to this one for a while too and just let it go, get lost in the music. I would so say easy. it is a little more in your wheelhouse, but I still really enjoyed it. So the bass, I would say for me, is kind of mid to lower. Mm -hmm. Not not mid to lower bass. I mean in yeah, level, yeah. in terms yeah, of yeah. level. Like of, of my of my range, of yeah. my ideal range. 
so uh, almost like um, a perceived neutral base. Mm-hmm. Would you say that's fair? I, I would I say it's like a yeah. perceived neutral base, which is kind of what I like. And I find its mids to be very linear. Yes. Um, so I almost feel like um, Theo was going for maybe a studio monitor type sound. I don't know. I, I haven't talked to him about it. And then the um, as far as the highs go, the funny thing is with the highs, there were times I found it to be at the top right. of where mine, mm-hmm. like my preference is, but didn't cross it. And so I love when that happens sometimes. So it, it, it's I found it to be sparkly. Yeah. And... Um, and you quite enjoyed it. That's my that's my area. So yeah. that is probably very much in your wheelhouse, I'm guessing. It is. So, so that one also, I got an MDAC score. Oh, did you? Yeah, because I wanted to see, you know, a lot of the ones that had, you know, we know that uh, MDACs can like in-ears that have more bass than I generally find, you know, um, ideal. Right. Certainly higher than you find ideal. Mm-hmm. Um, and this one... I was very curious about how it would score because, like I said, to me, it's kind of on the mid to lower side of, you know, bass wise presentation, yeah. more linear sounding, mm-hmm. more, again, perceived neutral. And um, it scored in, in timbre uh, a 4.8. Yeah. Yeah. And its overall score was a 4.6. Immersiveness was 4.0. Nice. So it did very well. And um, yeah, that's, again, one of the cool things about multi dimensional audio quality score yeah. to me is that it, 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 it can have equivalent scores for things that don't sound the same, which is more like real life to me, right? You, like there are headphones and earphones I love that have two completely different sound signatures that I would score the same yeah. if I had to score them. But this one we both enjoyed. Um, but yeah, probably more in your wheelhouse, but I would definitely not miss this one. Yeah, they told us this was something that was about two-ish years in development and it really shows. Yes. So when you're at uh, CanJam, make sure to stop by the headphones.com exhibit, try out the Dunu Mirai. Now, one of the big stories in terms of new driver technologies over the last couple of years, and largely thanks to one very energetic Michael Ricci from x yep. is the x driver, Yeah, uh, their driver technology. Um, it's a MEMS microspeaker. Mm-hmm. Incredible performance, measured performance in the time domain. Very resolving. Yeah. And people wanted to hear it, productized. Mm-hmm. And at CanJam New York, Creative Labs will have the... Creative Labs, Orvana Ace, and Ace 2. Yes. They're they're kind of like uh, AirPods Pro form factors. Yeah, it's a true wireless with a stock. Yeah, yeah. And, and, they're, and they're largely identical. Yes. Different appearance in terms of finish. Yeah. $20 difference. Mm-hmm. All right. The Orvana Ace, $129. Orvana Ace 2, $149. Mm-hmm. Um, both have, again, they're true wireless, LC3, Aptex Adaptive, Aptex, AAC, and SBC. And there's some new codecs in there. Yeah. Yeah. The Orvana Ace 2 mm-hmm. adds Aptex lossless. Yes. So there's the differences. Um, in each of them, XMEM solid state driver coupled with a 10 millimeter dynamic driver. Yep. Now, if you heard the Orvana Ace or Orvana Ace 2, I think it was at CanJam Dallas. I heard it at Dallas, yeah. That's the first time I think I heard it. Mm-hmm. It was a pre-production unit. I I was I thought it was okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, I felt like it was a little too thick, maybe, as I recall it, and that I wasn't hearing enough x mems Yeah, I can see that, yeah. So when they sent us a couple of units for the preview, I was a little concerned. I wasn't sure what, we're, what to expect. Right. They To me, to my ears, they've improved it. Yeah. So I don't know if it's through firmware updates, if there were just changes that were made. I don't know. So if you heard it at Can Jam Dallas and you weren't impressed, even at $129, $149, I think you will be now. Yes. So now I feel like I'm hearing the x mems driver doing its mm-hmm. thing. Yep. And the 10 millimeter dynamic driver has a, a rich, like a rich tonality. It adds a rich tonality to it. Yeah, I would say its base is probably above your ideal range. It is, so I'd end up probably using their app to EQ that down a little yeah, bit. Yeah, which you can do, which is nice. Yeah. The app does allow you to do that. And for me, it's at the top of my range. It's mm-hmm. it's a bassier piece, a richer sounding piece. Yeah. But I love that I can hear now that 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 MEMS that X MEMS driver. Yeah. So if you're curious about X MEMS. Definitely stop by for 129, 149 bucks. You can't go right. wrong. Stop by Creative Labs exhibit. Listen to the Orvana Ace and Ace Two for sure. Okay, now I want to take a second to talk about two ears that we have experience with. Limited experience. Limited experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're not here on the table, but I want to let you know they'll be at Can Jam New York because there will likely be a queue for these. Yeah, they're coming in from Singapore. First up is Symphonium Audio. We'll be showing off their Crimson. 
Now the Crimson, they don't tell us what's inside of this thing. They do tell us that it's a balanced armature driver design, but they don't break down how many drivers we have. And they're making a point. They are. So they're essentially saying, this is my take, like, if you like the way it sounds, who cares how many drivers it has? I think they don't want to play that whole driver count That's game. their take too, yeah. yeah. It doesn't matter what the total number is. Right. But it sounds lovely. I'll get to that in a second. The exterior here, you can see that it has a forged carbon faceplate. This thing looks better in person than it does in photos, so make sure to pick it up and handle it. Take a look at it. At the I show. should agree. I have a, I have a, a knife, a kind of a fancier knife that is, has a handle made of that similar yeah. material. Uh, almost identical almost yeah and uh, it's gorgeous in person it needs multi-directional light it's i, I think yeah, i agree but yeah. it's really pretty and then it also has an al6061 aluminum body it's going to set you back around 1500 dollars, but that 1500 dollars is going to buy you a lovely sound so it's got a kind of a brighter more trebly focused upper end it's very detailed very resolving very clean still has some nice body throughout the rest of the signature, but it's the, the detail that really stands out to me, and that's what grasped me. Oh, I know. I, I, I knew you'd love it. Yeah. So so when I listen to it, like you said, it has, it has it, it's, it's impactful. It is. But it also, I would say it's treble. Yep. Is on the higher side of my range. I see that, yeah. Uh, but I still enjoyed its sound very much. But listening to it, I, I already knew Brian's going to love this thing, and yep. he did. So... Uh, my buddy uh, John JP one one eight zero one on the forums. We yep. organized a bunch of can jams together back in the old days. Mm -hmm. um, he was at Can Jam London last year. Heard it, had to have it. Yeah. So there were some there was some hoop jumping that needed to happen to to, to order it at there the was. show. Yeah. And uh, like uh, several people there, he did the hoop jumping because he had to have it. I don't so, blame him. Yeah. Yeah. So now, uh, oh, I, I should mention on the water cooler thread. They're 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 pretty big, I think. On the, I'm not surprised on the on the crimson. that makes sense from them. Yeah, another one they're kind of big on is is Nightjar Acoustics. Right, singularity, mm -hmm. single driver design, single driver per side, dynamic driver. Yep. I heard it for the first time at Can Jam London to hear what all the fuss was about. I yeah. get it. Um, it is a richer sounding single driver IEM, very resolving. Mm -hmm. Given the fact that it has such a rich sound, bigger sounding than I'd expect a single dynamic per side to be. Yep. Um, I can see why people dig it. Oh, yeah. uh, it's, I think, $1,300. And they pretty much can't stop talking about it in the water cooler thread. Yeah. Uh, so that doesn't surprise me either. So a lot of head fires, I think, are very curious about Nightjar and Symphonium. Mm -hmm. These kind of really well-regarded IEM makers from Singapore. Yep. And so they'll be at Can Jam New York. Don't miss them. Now, continuing on that Singapore train for another second here, this is the Fat Freak Scarlet Mini. It's down here at the end. I'm just going to jump right into it. This is a piece when you put it in your ear, it's going to be a wow moment. It is a base cannon, as they describe it, and it's, it's such a great name for it. A great they're term. unapologetic. They are. They act, they're act. they the ones who actually use the term base they cannon. They use the term, and yep. it applies so well. Right. Now, they don't tell us what's inside. They say there are proprietary dynamic woofers, base chambers, and acoustic damping networks, and they tell us that it includes proprietary tubeless hyper tweeter system. So it's it's one of those things that are kind of kept under a veil. However, base heads, this is going to be an IEM for you. They they also say that it has the world's first 30 dB sub bass shelf in an in ear, and this I'll be you know right up front. This is not my personal signature, but for you base heads out here out there, this is a cannot miss. It's it's one of those things that's kind of like a love letter to bass. Yeah, the, the obviously the team at Fat Freak loves their bass. They do unapologetically so. Yep. And the thing about it is, yes, it's above where I want to mm -hmm. have my bass. But if you can hear past the bass, not easy to do. Right. But if you can hear past the bass, to me, it's doing a lot of things right. It's doing a lot of nice stuff up there. And so the other thing is, you know, when I think about, I was very interested in this because it, it, when I think about when I used to rent cars mm -hmm. every once in a while, in the old days, they had physical bass and treble controls. Right. And rarely would you get in the car that you were renting where the bass and treble controls were set to the middle. Mm -hmm. They're always turned all the way up. And at, the, at minimum, the bass was always turned all the way up. People yeah. love their bass. Consumers love their bass. Mm -hmm. So I was curious to see how this would do. Because like I said, if you can hear past the bass, it seems to be doing a lot of things right. So I wanted to see what MDAX would say about it. You did? Yes, I did. So I ran it on MDAX. Okay. And not surprisingly, Moss T, or mean opinion score Timbre, mm -hmm. scored a 4.8 out of 5. All right. Uh, it's immersiveness scored 4.8, overall 4.3. So it did very well for but, for something with that signature. And yeah. I'm not surprised because, again, if you hear past the bass, and for some people, they don't want to hear past the bass at all. They want it all. Exactly. It's doing a lot of things right. Plus, it has the bass. I think it has a lot of appeal for a lot of people. If you look on the forums, the people who love it, love it. Oh, yeah. So if this describes something that you're into, 
if you like things that are you know more impactful, mm -hmm. visceral, then the Fat Freak, Scarlet Mini, and the rest of their lineup has to be listened to. Last December, I went to the E Earphone Podafest show. Love that show. Love that show in Tokyo. What, in Tokyo, what a great show! So highlights for me were definitely hanging out with Oliver Marino, the engineer at Visioneers, mm -hmm. and also Lee Kuan Min, yes, the engineer at Elysian Acoustic Labs. Just the conversations we were having, technical discussions, mm -hmm. discussions about measurements, just brilliant. Anyway, Elysian Acoustic Labs will be at CanJam New York. Yeah. Now, even among the snobbiest of the IEM Cognoscenti, I would say Elysian Acoustic Labs is among the top ranked companies. Yeah, I think so. Companies. And the first time I heard Elysian was uh, at CanJam Singapore a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. the Diva. Yeah. And I think the Diva has kind of been overshadowed since then by the Annihilator. A yeah. bolder, like really resolving, big bass, beautiful, rich sounding mm -hmm. in here. One of my favorites. Yep. But the Diva is also one of my favorites. And it's more subdued. And the thing is, it has like different signatures that you can get with switches. Yeah. And sometimes when you have an IEM with switches, you don't have two or three usable signatures. There's just right. one. Yeah. But with the switches on the Diva, all are usable signatures. Mm -hmm. I would say compared to the Annihilator, it would be more on the perceived neutral side for me. Oh, yeah. With those adjustments. So that you mm -hmm. can kind of flex it around to different, kind of morph it around to different things. Like you said earlier when we were talking about it uh, in preparation, you were saying um, it's kind of like an as the mood strikes. Those yeah. switches let you change it around. And yeah, so when you it, want something a little more romantic, just make it that way. Yeah, it can be a few different things yeah. in, a, in, in a great way each way. Yeah. And um, yeah, so anyways, don't miss the Diva. Don't miss the Annihilator. Find out. If you haven't heard them, why they're among the most respected in-ears on the planet. And in fact, I think in the water cooler thread, the Annihilator pretty much ranks when they do the polling yeah. as one of the top choices. I think so, yeah. No big surprise for me. Now, I will say this. I can't promise because we don't know. Lee wasn't sure Okay. Um, if they would have. So in Tokyo, I heard some prototypes. And I know he's trying to get at least one of them ready for CanJam New York. Okay, this is news to me. Yes, but he's not sure that he'll have them ready. Um, so I don't want to promise anything, oh. but you want to stop by the exhibit in case they do. And if he has the one I'm hoping he has there, um, you know, listen to it, hear what you think, and then ask him how much it's likely to cost. That's all I'll say. Um, but if they don't have it, you still have two of the best, two of the most well-regarded IEMs on the planet yep. at Elysian's exhibit. So definitely don't miss their exhibit. All right, now Music Tech is no stranger to Can Jam. They've been at a number of our shows, and they always have a massive exhibit with yes. a ton of popular gear. So I don't have any of these pieces here, but I do want to mention that these will be on many people's lists. There are a few things you have to stop by and check out. First thing up, they're going to have the Aroma Audio Fei Wan. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's a 12-driver hybrid with 10 BAs and 2 Dynamics. Now, uh, Fabio19 on the forums, he says he's never heard an Aroma sound so good. Now, the Aroma Audio Jewel that came out previously that I had to, a chance to listen to here, that was wonderful in the high end. So if this is the best sounding Aroma high end he's ever heard, I got to hear that myself. So that's going to be there. They're also going to have the, and I hope I pronounce this again correctly, the <laughs> Unique Melody Mason FS, which is fabled sound, Nuit Etoile. You're I, looking at me. I don't speak French. I don't speak French. Je ne parle pas so, français. 13 drivers inside, uh, four bass drivers, four mid drivers, two mid treble drivers, two treble drivers, and one bone conduction driver. So Blank Disc from the forums, he says that this is best-in-class natural and analog sound with top-of-the-line technical performance and three-dimensional soundstage with photorealistic imaging. A couple of those details that sound like things that I want to try. It may not be in my wheelhouse, but I think I'd be at least intrigued to check it out. So that's definitely one you're going to want to see. They're also going to have a more on-the-budget-friendly side, a Timsock, TS-316 there for you to demo. Now, the Timsock is just a single dynamic driver IEM, but as we've already discussed in the in-ear section, you can do a lot with a single dynamic. The This is getting rave reviews in the forums. It's only like 500 bucks. Scuba Devils, he says it's nicely balanced and highly resolving with a touch of warmth and crisp, airy treble with, treble with overall excellent clarity. 500 bucks, I want to hear that piece. So do I. So that's another piece I'm going to stop by and listen. 
And you may have experience, I think with this brand, at least for the, the last piece, yeah. Canper is going to, the 6P622B will be there. I think that's the model that I heard. That is the one you heard. You okay, that is. That's the one that has the um, uh, Sonian bone conduction mid-range. It, it, it's a 10-driver tribrid. So six Sonian balanced armature drivers, two Sonian electrostatics, and two Sonian bone conduction drivers. I thought one of those bone conduction drivers was like a mid-band it bone might conduction. Be. Yeah. So Executor from the forums, he says that it's neutral, maybe slightly warm with voices to die for. That last line, that that's got me. I, I want to get there and listen to that. Yeah. So well, okay. So this is a funny story. Canjam London, it was. Canjam London. Canjam yeah. London. I, I think they the, Canper was there as an exhibitor. They were. And they didn't. I think their signage or something didn't arrive. I think it. Was so they literally like printed <laughs> information on like eight by eleven paper. Yep. Eight and a half by eleven paper, and then like. They were on a wall, it, taped yeah. it to a board or something yeah. like that. So what happened was their, their exhibit, no offense, Camper, it didn't look very serious, right? Yeah. So they weren't getting a lot of attention, right? And so toward the end of the show, I just said, you know what, let me sit down and listen because their, you know, their exhibit was a bit slow. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's just because it wasn't as noticeable amidst it all the other big out, exhibits, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so I go to listen, and I listen to the, I think it was a CP six twenty two B. Oh, that name. Yeah. But anyway, so I listened to that one. And I was like, what? That was so, it was so good. Yeah. Like, so good. And it was so good that actually Cameron, uh, Golden Sound, was kind of walking by and I go, have you heard this one yet? And he says, no, what is it? And I told him. Yep. He sits down and he looks at me, he's, this is good. Right? Like, and then, then I think when people saw us kind of ooing and eyeing about it. Yeah. Then they were coming and listening too, because some of our friends were there. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to listen. Now, next thing you know, we have a crowd. Yep. And then I found out later in the show it already ended. Yeah. The show. Yeah. Ended. So there was a crowd and everybody was listening to it at the very end of the show. Yep. And I want to spend more time with the Camper six, CP622B. I have got to hear that again, because as first impressions go, silly impressive. Yep. On a flagship level, as I recall. Yep. So I want to hear it again. So again, we ran through so many in-ears here. That was the Aroma Audio Fei Wan. Unique Melody, Mason FS, Nui Etoile, Timsock TS316, and Camper 6P622B, all at Music Tech. I've already mentioned Visioneers when we were talking about Astle and Kern. Yeah. They did the collaboration piece with Astle and Kern, the, uh, the Aura. The Aura. Yeah. Uh, love that piece. Again, sold out. Anyways, I won't talk about it since it's gone. But one I did not miss out on is the Visioneers VE10. Yep. I'm going to tell a story. I like telling stories. But I think I already told some version of this in a previous preview. Anyway. Maybe. Deal with it. So so here it is. So uh, Can Jam London, um, last year during setup, um, talking to one of the most respected IEM engineers on the planet who does not work for VE mm -hmm. and has never worked for Visioneers. Right. We're talking about IEMs from other companies that he loves. And he immediately asks me, have you heard the VE10 from Visioneers? I said, I have not. He said, oh, go over there and see if they have one out already. And go listen to it. I said, what about it is so special? He said, I love the whole thing, but it's the base. Mm -hmm. Like the base is incredible. Like, you know, this, this this designer has designed one of the most respected IEMs when it comes to base. I right. won't say which one. So for him to say that was a big deal. I said, what about the base is so special? He said, the texture. Great impact, but it's an eight millimeter single, eight millimeter dynamic driver, but that texture. He goes, go listen to it. So I did. Went over there, asked if I could listen to it. And I listened to it for just a little while. Immediately great first impressions. Loved it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fast forward. December last year. Yep. E-earphone. Uh, Podifest. Podifest. Yeah. Tokyo. I see Oliver Marino, we get to hang out, talking his design philosophies and everything else. I sit down, I listen to the VE title, I want to hear it again. Mm -hmm. Heard it a little bit, now I want to hear it for longer. Whipped out an Astell and Kern player, played it, fell in love with it. Now I knew I had to have it. Mm -hmm. It is one of my references. That designer who said the bass texture is incredible is right. The bass presence is beautiful. I would say it's literally right smack down the middle of where I like my base to be. Okay. Right there. So for you, it might be on the slightly higher side or higher side. Maybe. But yeah. I think you're still going to love it. You just haven't heard it because I I mean, it's it's I literally just got it not long ago right. and took delivery of it. And it is one of my references. And so it's kind of been in my bag all the mm -hmm. time. You should hear it more for sure because I think you're going to love it. But yeah, right down the middle on the base. Incredible texture from that eight millimeter dynamic driver. Did I say what the drivers are yet? I did no, not. No, another full okay. compliment. Okay, so it's a five way ten driver hybrid IEM. Uh, it has one eight millimeter dynamic driver with acoustic low pass. Okay, that's the dynamic driver. Not a huge driver, right? But incredible texture and presence. Four mid low BAs, 
two mid BAs, two mid high BAs, one super tweeter BA. So it doesn't have the EST that Oliver right. is so good at integrating. In fact, in the Elysium that they did yeah. um, some years back, I think that might have been the first great implementation mm -hmm. of the Sonian EST that I heard. Yeah. That's not an easy thing to integrate. Most of the guys are figuring that out now. Oliver figured it out right away. He got it because mm -hmm. we talked about that. Yep. Anyways, back to the Visioneers VE10. Does not have the EST. But even with that one super tweeter BA, mm -hmm. he, he he gets this incredibly beautiful extended sweet treble. And if you told me it had a Sonian in there, I might believe it. Yeah. Because it's so detailed and extended. I, the whole thing. I just love the whole thing. So if you want to hear what is one of my top references right now, IEMs at any price, the Visioneers VE10, that'll be at Bloom Audio's exhibit. It has a beautiful anodized aluminum shell, by the way. Mm hmm. Um, machining it, is excellent. Machining is excellent, but honestly, that's so secondary to me. Yeah, it, it could be see-through plastic. I wouldn't care if it sounded the way it does. Yeah. So don't miss it. Blue Audio Visioneers VE10. Now, one of the videos that you and I have been talking about making, and I hope we can get to it soon, is a video about our favorite True Wireless. Yeah. Uh, our favorite True Wireless earphones from an audiophile perspective. Yep. Okay, I'm going to cut to the end for my favorite True Wireless earphone for listening to music dedicatedly. Hi-Fi Man, Sponar Wireless. Yep. It is simply the most resolving of the bunch we have, and we have a lot. We do. Um, it's the most resolving. It has the resolution to me of a good wired in-ear. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tonally. I love its tonal balance. I would call it, as true wireless goes, I would say more kind of on the neutral side. Yeah. Uh, there's good bass presence. The, the treble is probably getting to more of the top of where my range is, but it's mm -hmm. not right to me. So right. that's good. So its overall resolution is fantastic. And why? Why is it so resolving? I don't know, but it has a Himalaya DAC, yeah, which is pretty incredible. I should mention that. So for the Svanar Wireless, Hi-Fi Man decided not to approach it really as just a true wireless earphone. Mm -hmm. It was a system. It was a miniature audio system. So they focused on the amplification. So there's a very special little amplifier inside. Yeah. And the DAC. Yeah. And it uses, again, their Himalaya R to R DAC architecture. Yes, it's a true wireless earphone. With a with an R to R DAC inside. Yep. And they use Hi-Fi Man's topology diaphragm. I'll also mention it has Bluetooth 5.2, active noise cancellation, touch operation, support for LDAC, IPX water resistance. I should mention that support for LDAC. Mm -hmm. So that model has LDAC. I don't remember if the other models do. We're going to get to those in a second. But I will say that with Android is where I get the best sound from it yeah. using LDAC. It still sounds great out of an iPhone with AAC, but it's with LDAC that I get the best performance. So I use it with my Samsung uh, Galaxy S23 Ultra. So if you want to hear, again, cutting to the chase, you want to hear the most resolving true wireless in-ear for music listening, Svanar Wireless. Now, there are two other models. I'll let you go over those ones because I, we neither of us has heard them. Yeah. So those are newer releases, yeah. um, more recent, but they have the Svanar Wireless LE, which seems to be like the little brother of the Svanar Wireless. And I just did a real quick check. It does have LDAC in it. Oh, it does. So okay. it does. Okay. Um, it's the it's based on the Himalaya LE DAC, which is slightly different from the Himalaya. I'm not exactly sure what the differences are. It's still an R to R DAC. It though. is still an R to yeah. R DAC, and it's still in that Himalaya family. Um, otherwise, it's it's basically just uh, it, it's not as premium in the fit and finish. Okay. Overall, like the materials. Exactly. All right. But uh, it's gonna save you like two hundred bucks. Yeah, I did. I do think they said though that it, sound wise, it's it's pretty much right there. With... I think I think they're meant to be. Right on Svanar Wireless, other. right. Yeah. But it's $200 less. So $499 right. for the Svanar Wireless, $299 for the LE. Yep. Okay. And then they also have the Svanar Wireless Junior. It, I don't think it has an R to R inside. They don't list specifically which DAC. If they did, if it was R to R, they would list it. Yeah. Exactly. I think they would. Yeah. The advantage there is, first of all, it's highly affordable at $179. And then you actually get an extra hour of runtime out of that. So the other two models get seven hours continuous. This gets eight. And then all four or all three models have about four charges in the, the case. So yeah, we to be clear, we've heard the Svanar Wireless. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. True wireless earphone. Yep. The Svanar Wireless LE we have not heard, but we right. hear that it's close, yeah. Pretty close to the Svanar Wireless. And the junior we haven't heard. Right. So we'll be hearing them for the first time at Canjam New York too. So do not miss the Svanar Wireless for sure. Now, of all the gear we've listened to in common, mm -hmm. we have very few common references. Right. We have enough, our tastes are different enough that we we don't have very many common references. But since we're in in-ears, one of the common references is actually an in-ear. It's a yeah. Sennheiser IE900. Right. We both love that in-ear. Now, I'm not going to say much more about it. You should listen to it. It is still their flagship in-ear. It'll be at Sennheiser's exhibit. Uh, we did a full video about it yeah. when it first came out. I think it was a pretty good video. It was. So watch that if you want to know 
more details about its design and what we think about how it sounds. Okay. I'm also mentioning it because they sent us something called the Sennheiser MMCX microphone cable. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to make, I'm not, what, what more can I say about it? It enables one of our favorite in-ears yep. to be used while we're on the many video calls and, and uh, audio only calls that you and I are involved in uh, here at Headfine. Right. And not having to change it out just to make a phone call or video call. I love that. So if you have the right dongle for a phone or on your computer, that's a wonderful thing. So look for that. I think it's a big deal for anybody like us who likes any of the IE models that it fits with. Yeah. Again, the 200, 300, 600, and 900. Um, then it's a big deal. All right. So now I want to talk about what I really want to talk about, though, with Sennheiser, which we'll touch on a little bit on the Sennheiser IE900. And that's the Sennheiser Momentum True Wireless 4, which they just announced. Right. Um, so brand spanking new. Mm -hmm. And it replaces, of course, the Momentum True Wireless 3. Now, here's what I'm going to say about it. The Sennheiser Momentum True Wireless 4 and the 3 before it have a tonal balance that I love so very much that I actually think, and I told this to Yermak from, uh, uh from Sennheiser and another Sennheiser engineer, that I think it's the best tonal balance of any of their in-ears. Right. So if I could take that tonal balance and transplant it onto the wired resolution of the IE900, we might, I'd, of course, you'd have to hear it, we might have an in-ear that I prefer to the IE900. Mm -hmm. That's how much I love the tonal balance of it. So the Sennheiser Momentum True Wireless 1 and 2, I had to EQ. The yep. 3 I didn't, the 4 I don't have to. And um, that's how much I love the tonal balance. You must hear it. It's one of my two favorite audiophile in-ears for, uh, tr True Wireless in-ears for listening to music. Right. But it's versatile because the 4 adds Qualcomm Aptex lossless, so that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Adaptive noise cancellation. Right. And we haven't flown with it yet, but I would have to guess, just guessing until we fly with it, I won't know, that it probably will do quite well there. It sounds like it's going to do quite well there. Six mic system for outgoing voice. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't really done a lot of testing with that uh, on speech quality or even subjective speech quality, so we'll do that. But so far, encouraging. Seven and a half hours of runtime, 30 total with charging case, one hour of play with an eight-minute charge. So this is a versatile audiophile piece. Mm -hmm. It is, again, one of my two favorite audiophile true wireless in-ears for listening to music, but it's also very versatile. Right. Um, you can't miss the Momentum True Wireless 4. It is really that impressive at Sennheiser's exhibit and the IE900. Now, we can't talk in-ears without talking cables. They make the whole system work. And at CanGem New York this year, there will be a number of cable manufacturers showing off some new options, new terminations, new connectors, and things that I think Headfires will want to check out. Let's start with Elotech. They're bringing their Elotech Versa system, which was announced on the forums late last year, and it's starting to roll out. People will get their first chance really to try it in person at CanJam New York this year. It's a swappable MMCX and two pin system. So most in-ears, you're covered from that. The best part for me, though, is that it's swappable without tools. It's a hand twist, pop out the old one, pop in the new one, cinch it back down, you're done. So if you've been concerned about carrying multiple in-ears with MMCX and 2-pin together because you'll need a tool to swap things out, you might potentially lose that tool. Just travel with, you know, ease of mind. You don't need the adapter here. They're also going to be pairing it at the show with the Ode to Laura cable here, which they sent along for us to try. I do want to give a little, a little bit of a breakdown as to what's inside because there's a couple of guys that are really interested in this thing. It's a 22 gauge four wire design, triple bespoke premium OCC copper blend. It has a quadruple stranding design with nine interior corelets, and it's finished with Elatex custom designed Y split cable. The machining on this is lovely. And I mentioned that it's a copper cable. The, they continue that copper accent look throughout the entire design, and it's very attractive. I love the look. So do I. So they're showing it, they're showing that with the, the Versa system at CanJam New York this year. Um, and I do also want to mention that the Versa system was designed in collaboration with DD Hi-Fi. Yeah. But it's not just that Versa system they'll be showing off. They're also showing off two cable prototypes this year. Prototype Alpha, Prototype Bravo. And these are going to be... Okay, I don't know a lot of information about them. They didn't give us much. But I'm intrigued by what Eric has said. First of all, they are two cables dedicated for in-ears. So IEM guys, stop by, try them out. And then they're... Er, their marketing director, Eric Chong, has hinted at some cool design choices. They were hints. He didn't really go into full detail, but it was kind of tantalizing, so I want to stop by and see what they're doing. There's something else, though. They're showing two new in-ear prototypes, IEMs, not cables, at their exhibit. I know nothing about these other than that they exist. Neither do I. Yeah, that's all I know. They're going to be gathering headfire feedback, so if you're going to be at CanJam New York, stopping by the Elatech exhibit, 
check out their two new prototype cables, their two new prototype in-ears, as well as the Versa system. Now, there's another set of cables that Headfires will absolutely want to check out at Can Gym New York this year. They're coming from Effect Audio. They're down there by you. It's the Effect Audio Code 24 and Code 24C Limited. Let's go ahead and start with the Code 24. It's the Cosmic Blue Cable, and it's a 16.5 gauge two-wire design with premium UPOCC silver-plated copper lits, 13 multi-sized core bundles, and it comes with support for the full Connex and Termex system. So if you're looking for something with just two pin and MMCX, the Connex will get you started, but you can also buy options for IPX, Pentacon, and A2DC. And if you're looking on the Termex side, uh, it, it comes with uh, 4.4 and 3.5 millimeter and 2.2 millimeter, but you can also buy optional lightning terminations, USB-C terminations, or you can get the cable terminated only in 4.4 if you don't want to deal with the hassle of swapping. It's a $799 in the IEM version, $999 in the full-size headphone. I should mention that it also comes for full-size headphones if you want to, to go that route. And they call it the most flexible 16.5 gauge IEM cable in the world. It is flexible, very comfortable. But I'll be quite honest, as soon as I opened the package and I looked at these things, I had to go straight for the 24C Limited. The color, it just grabbed me right away. It's a galactic purple. I adore that color. They, they did a phenomenal job with it. It, it's uh, the 24C Limited is an 18 and a half gauge two wire design, premium UP OCC copper lits with 17 multi-sized core bundles inside, full support for Connex and Termex, and it's only $499. Now, this is only for IEMs, doesn't do the full size headphone like the full size Code 24 does, and it's only limited to 500 worldwide. That's all they're making, so you're going to have to fight me for one of those 500. Um, when it came in, like we were, you were talking earlier about the IE900, I popped it on there right away. If you're looking for an aftermarket cable, this is one that is fully... Oh, so it fits the IE900. It fits the IE900 okay. right out of the box. And I, the, the, it just felt right. I, I love that combination together. So when you're at Can Jam New York, stop by FX Audio's exhibit, bring your favorite in-ears and even full-size headphones now. Try these two together. While we're on the subject of cables at Can Jam, it's become one of the most fun product categories at the show. I'm going to explain why. So when you go to, say, the water cooler thread on HeadFi, a very busy thread, they talk about cables a lot in the water cooler thread, the crew there. And then the water cooler crew, a lot of them go to the can jams. And what you'll see is they get together and they, because they're so easy to swap you know, with each other, they swap cables and you see them auditioning cables with the different IEMs, swapping IEMs. Yep. And it's just so fun. There's so much camaraderie there. And they talk about cables again, a lot in the thread. And then they get to do that sort of living embodiment of the thread at can jam. And it's so fun. So anyway, I wanted to mention that. Uh, I got my water cooler badge, which I'm really thrilled about. So anyway, I want to talk about another cable company. You mentioned Effect Audio and Elatec. Yep. We've been using their cables for a long time. Oh, yeah. We have a lot of their cables here at Headfi HQ. But one of the companies whose cables we started using recently are Flash, is Flash Acoustics. Yeah. Flash Acoustics, I picked up their flagship cable, the Ultron. Mm -hmm. So Flash Acoustics isn't well known in the U.S. or Europe even. Right. But they're very well respected among cable makers and probably better known in Asia. Been using the Ultron. I'm not going to try to describe what's in it. There's just too much going on, but I'll we'll, we'll show you a cross section of it. Uh, I was using that at CanJam SoCal. Then I end up running into Chang, who right. is with Nightjar Acoustics and Subtonic. Mm -hmm. He saw I was using the Ultron and he said, have you tried the Thanos, which is Flash Acoustics? I think it's their model down from the Ultron. I said, no, no, I haven't tried it yet. He goes, I actually prefer the Thanos to the Ultron and explained why. So then I went to Flash Acoustics exhibit at Can Jam SoCal, mm -hmm. auditioned the Thanos, and ended up picking that up too. Now, yeah. the Ultron is mostly on the Annihilator. The Thanos is mostly on the Diva. Right. And then lately I've been swapping them back and forth. But at Can Jam, stop by Flash Acoustics exhibit and try their various cables. I think anybody interested in cables should do that. And then, of course, if you see these water cooler badges and you see us all gathered around socializing, swapping cables, do do say hello, join us and 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 join in that fun too. But definitely stop by Flash Acoustics Exhibit at Can Jam New York. And we should also mention that Ice Lab is going to be showing off their in-ears alongside Flash Acoustics right next door. Well, they're actually like sister companies. Yeah, yeah, they're going to be together. So those who don't know the name Ice Lab, it's a very elusive company. They only make a handful of in-ears every year. It's a very small number. And when people manage to track them down, they feel kind of lucky about it, but they're showing off one of those elusive models at, at Can Jam New York this year. It's called the Ice Lab Prismatica Gold Limited Edition. 
Now, I don't have many details, but I do have some photos. It's a nice looking piece, so I'm curious to get some ears on time with it. Same here. It is the gold version of the Prismatica, but again, I don't really know much. All I can really do is get some Google Translate, and I don't know if I trust 100% of Very that. Very enigmatic. Yeah, but they're only making 18 pairs of these. As in 1.8. As in 1.8. Yeah. So this is going to be maybe the only chance Headfires will get to try the Ice Lab Prismatica Gold Limited Edition at CanJam New York. Now, admittedly, some of the cables up here can be rather pricey. It can be kind of daunting to jump straight into that top tier of cabling. So if somebody's looking to swap out their stock cable, get their first chance at cable rolling, Headphones.com has a cool line of cables called the Listen More Cables, which I think we saw for the first time at Can Jam Can Dallas, Jam Dallas last year. Yeah. yeah, And I want to interrupt real quick because I do love the name. I think I mentioned this in the Can Jam Dallas preview. Yeah. So the owners of Headphones.com are Andrew and Taryn Lissamore, spelled mm -hmm. L-I-S-S-I-M-O-R-E. And the name of the company or the brand, I'm sorry, for of cables is Listen More. Yep. And so I asked them, you've been waiting, haven't you, you know, to 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 use Listen More, you know, because of the name and it rhymes mm -hmm. with their name. And they were like, well, of course. Right. So so I think it's cute. I love that they're using this name. It is cute. Yeah. And th luckily, they're showing them off at Can Jam New York this year. They're down there at the end. It's the blue and uh, silver Listen More etched cables. Now, right now, they come in three meters. So it's a long length. They're terminated in 3.5 millimeter dual connections on the headphone side. Yeah, right on the ear cup side. So they're compatible with some models from Focal, Hi-Fi Man, Meza Audio, Head Audio, Denon, Sony. And if you're one of those owners, you can bring your headphones to their show and try them out. They're going to have them there. Sure. It's uh, terminated in 6.35 millimeter or 4 pin XLR on the device side. So try it out with your favorite gear. They've talked about other options coming for terminations down the road, but right now that's what we have. They start at 99 bucks. So it's going to be easy on the wallet if that's your first place to get a first place to try t uh, cable rolling. Definitely stop by headphones.com's exhibit. Give the Listen More etched cables a chance. See if they're for you. Now, at CanJam New York, there are a lot of new over-ear headphones to listen to. Oh, yeah. Some great new ones. I yes. want to start with what I think is my, I would say is my number one recommendation of the over ears, the kind of must here. Mm -hmm. It's the Drop Plus Grell as an Axel Grell, um, legendary designer engineer behind most of Sennheiser's most legendary headphones. Yeah. Uh, it's the OAE1 signature headphones. So it's, it's an unusual headphone. Yes, it is. The design places the driver in front of your ears, mm -hmm. but not in an ear speaker form factor, right. more of a traditional headphone form factor. Now, he sent us a prototype quite some time ago. So it was, it was uh, I don't even remember when exactly. And I think we had just recently started evaluating with Head Acoustics MDAX. Yeah, they might've been right around that time. Right around that time. I'm, I'm trying to even remember if it was a MDAX prototype yeah. uh, version or if it was the final version. Anyway, the, or the first final version. Mm -hmm. And so um, we measured this thing that looked like a student project yeah. on the MDAX system. And it was by margin, the best scoring over ear headphone we had seen. Oh yeah. I think it might even still be until now. I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. So now, then then Axel sent us a few other prototypes. Yep. As he was versioning, you know, like uh, updating it. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I kind of felt like the original prototype was still the best one. There were a couple prototypes that I wasn't all that wild about. We then evaluated those on MDAX. They didn't score as well. Nothing right. scored as well as that original. But then in, at SoCal, I felt like they were getting closer yeah. to the prototype, but yeah, they, they were. still weren't there. That's the one I think they let everybody hear at Can Jam SoCal. Yeah, it was. And if you heard it at Can Jam SoCal, now you have to listen to the one that we have here, which is the one yeah. they should have at Can Jam New York in terms of the version, because I think that is the production voice version and kind of a production candidate in terms of manufacturers. Well. I'm pretty sure it is, yeah. And that one is the prototype refined. Yep. We ran it on MDAX, and it is, and it topped the prototype. So. Yeah. Uh, in terms of mean opinion score, timbre, so MOST, uh, that encompasses like tonal balance, among other things, 4.9 out of 5. Mm -hmm. MOSI, which is MOS immersiveness, 4.6, which is really awesome well, yeah. for an over-ear headphone. And mean opinion score overall was 4.9 out of 5. Yep. Again, this is the best best scoring MDAX scoring over-ear headphone we've so far yeah. uh, evaluated in the system. And if you want to hear that, you should. Now, I want to mention that immersiveness is didn't surprise me. The imaging is beautiful. Mm -hmm. So it's wide, but not overly diffuse at all. Yeah. So there's precision to the imaging. Adjust it 
you know, uh, it's just a front and back, so you don't have to angle it or anything. Yeah, and when you get it positioned, it just opens up. And locks in. Yeah. You'll know when you hit it. Yeah. And then the base. Yes. So I want to talk about the tonal balance, then I'll talk about the base because it, it, it's an important part of that. This is an open back headphone, mm -hmm. but it, it essentially is flat all the way to like 20. Right. With, and it, with a little bit of emphasis. So I would call it a rich neutral, if I had to say, or generalize what the sound signature could be described yeah, as. Yeah, that works. Yeah. So, so, but that bass for an yeah. open back headphone that's that open to be that deep and extended. It's surprising what it pulls off. Yes, very much so. So that's my, I would say that's the first thing I would go for if you're looking for an over-ear headphone. Mm -hmm. Listen to the Drop Plus Grell OAE One Signature headphones for sure. Now, we're in New York. Let's talk about a New York local, Abyss Headphones. They're from right around the Buffalo area, I believe. I think it's called Lancaster. They're coming down to join us at Can Jam New York this year, and they're going to be bringing what is, no doubt, my favorite headphone in their entire lineup, which is the Abyss Diana TC. Now, it's not their newest Diana. They actually have a more recent model, which is the Diana MR, and you've been traveling more with the MR lately than the TC yeah. when you've been on the road. So the, T, the TC, the, the Diana TC, I think is still their flagship Diana. I believe so. It is more resolving than the MR. It is. Okay, so listen to the TC for sure, the mm -hmm. Diana TC. But the MR for me, it, it, it has its own charm. And, oh, it's yeah. le and it's less expensive. Yeah. Um, uh, but it has its own charm. Yeah, I would call it smoother. Mm-hmm richer natively and i say natively because in its native configuration you can swap pads right i would use for me if you want to hear how i like it i like the the i think that the vegan ultra suede pads yeah that give it just a little bit of a little bit more richness a little bit more softness up top mm -hmm. and i love the way they sound that way so that's definitely the headphone i'd first recommend listening to just because it's their newest i and think it's I, also more efficient isn't it easy, oh it easy, is yeah yeah it is it is more efficient and i love the way it looks they oh they, they made it more comfortable yeah i don't know if they've done this to all the dianas but with the diana mr they had a new headband design mm -hmm. that's made to fit more heads right um and they do a, they did a whole video about what goes into it because it, it yeah. really looks quite simple from the outside but when you see them dissect yep the headband and what's actually inside, you really appreciate how much thought went into making it more comfortable. Oh, yeah. So they're going to be doing some cool things also at their exhibit. Really? Yeah. So they're going to be using, uh, uh, Joe Skabinski wrote me to tell me that they're going to be using an Otari MX5050 B2 reel to reel. Okay. Player, and they're going to be uh, playing copies of master tapes. Nice. So that would be a really fun place to visit because I want to hear that. I just want to hear this Otari. And, and of course, I'll be using their headphones to do so. And it's in a quieter space. Yeah. And oh, that's right. They they're, they have a, essentially a room. Yeah. So it'll be quieter. So that's a great place to be doing something like bringing a reel to reel. Oh, yeah. And then they'll have, I, I forgot to mention these in the in the desktop electronics section, mm -hmm. but they're going to have some cool electronics from 11 Audio. Oh, yeah. And they're going to have a new DAC from 11 Audio called the KDAC. It's an R to R DAC. So I can't wait to hear that one. You know, All right. Like, yeah. R to R and uh, Linear Tube Audio Z10e headphone amp. But the one I also want to mention is they're going to have the Riviera AIC10. Oh. Pure Class A. That's a hybrid to yeah. solid state amp. So I heard that first in Munich. Um, and then I heard it. Uh, a, a buddy of ours brought it to one of the can jams. Yep. And listened to it in his room. That is such a beautiful sounding amp. And they'll have that there. So I want to hear that. I didn't. I don't remember hearing it with Abyss headphones. So I guess I'll be plugging in probably the Diana TC. Most likely. Into the Riviera. So don't miss the Abyss headphones. I mean, you and I can go check out that Riviera. Yeah. Don't miss the Abyss headphones exhibit room. Yeah, they're a can't miss. Now, there's a headphone up here I want to talk about for a second. I'm excited that we got the chance to listen to it ahead of Can Jam New York. It's from Audio Technica, and we were talking about them a little bit earlier. It's here in the middle. It's the Audio Technica ATH AWKG. And first of all, you're going to notice that that wood may look kind of familiar to some photos we showed earlier in that uh, Kurogaki wood from the, uh, the Narukami amplifier. So it's the black persimmon wood. It looks stunning. It, the photos don't do it justice. You have to see it in person. Yeah, that's one case where I'll say definitely the photos don't do it justice. It was actually funny when we were when you were taking photos. I remember I shined a flashlight on it, yeah. and, and Joe was like, whoa. And the texture popped. Yeah, the texture yeah. just popped. Yeah. So it's a hard one to capture the full beauty of. It is. Yeah, anyways. And I spent some time listening to it, and I want to say, first of all, I'm surprised. But it's a 53 millimeter dynamic driver inside, and they say the driver, I'm going to try and pronounce this correctly, is a Perminder iron cobalt alloy, and it has a titanium alloy flange ring. Now, part of that system in the driver, they say they have the ATS, AT's double air damping system, the DADS. 
and Audio Technica says that this ensures a smooth and accurate low frequency response while providing a closed back headphone with a transparent sounding sound stage akin to open back headphones. Now I'm going to take a second here and say when I was listening and jotting down my notes for the initial impressions, one of my first notes was that I kind of got a vibe. It was ATH ADX 5000 esque, right? Which, when reading the description for the DADS system, that tracks. That that makes sense to me. And it's just one of those things where the sound signature has some really nice texture going on in kind of the richness of the sound, and people will get the chance to try this at CanJam New York. Yeah, I was excited when it arrived. So uh, John Teruli from Audio Technica was nice enough to stop by mm -hmm. Head HQ to drop these off. And and the one thing that I didn't know was going to be happening, and there's a real cool story behind it. It's a community-driven story. Yep. We just don't have time to get into it right now. So maybe ask them about it um, or ask ZMF about it, right? Yeah. Um, uh, it came with another set of ear pads mm -hmm. made by ZMF. Right. So with the stock ear pads, I think it's kind of on the, it's like a, a more leaner, like a leaner signature uh, for me, probably on the brighter side of okay. my tastes. Then I swapped in the ZMF pads and that for me was definitely more my jam. Mm -hmm. So that one, I loved it with the ZMF pads. And 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 I think that's the one you spent the more more time with. Was I think with the I Z only listened to the ZMF only, pads. Okay, you only yeah. listened to the ZMF pads. So we didn't want to do too much swapping of the pads because right. it's such a rare headphone. Well, there's only like, what, 15 of these? Yeah, I don't think it would be a problem to swap the pads back and forth. We just were treating it extra We're babying careful. it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So with the ZMF pads, adds a little richness, adds a little smoothness. Mm -hmm. um, maybe... Maybe not as wide as sound staging, but still, but still images beautifully. Yeah, I, I might even say, even though it might not be as wide as the stock pads, it probably imaged for me better. Okay. So for me, there was just almost no, no disadvantage to using the ZMF pad. So, anyways, when you go to uh, their exhibit, I'm sure they'll have both. Yeah. Uh, pads. They will. Uh, try the ZMF if you want to hear what I prefer. I would definitely be curious to know what most people think. See if there's a consensus on that. When it comes to FIO, the first thing that comes to mind for me isn't, at least not yet, uh, over-ear headphones. No, it's portable players. Portable players, for sure. Um, but I think they will start entering our consciousness with respect to over-ear headphones mm -hmm. because they seem to be very serious about over-ear headphones. I think so. And they are, they're bringing the sensibilities that they bring to their portable players, mm -hmm. which is strong value, technical performance, yep. um, but for reasonable prices, mm -hmm. to over-ear headphones. And the one that I'm talking about is the FIO FT3. Right. It's an over-ear dynamic headphone. Uh, it's a large diaphragm dynamic headphone, 60 millimeters, which is actually very large for Quite a sensible. for a standard cone type driver. It's I believe is that an ADLC? It's a DLC, DLC diaphragm, yeah. so diamond like carbon diaphragm, uh, brilliant plated gasket, angled drivers, and 350 ohm impedance. That's surprising. Right yeah. There. Now it comes with two sets of ear pads. It comes. Crazy accessorized. Oh, it's well equipped. So it comes with a lot of different accessories, cables, two different sets of pads, cases, 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 cases. cases. yeah. And um, that's uh, that's part of the whole value thing we're talking about. Yeah, two sets of pads. I strongly prefer the suede ear pads. The mm -hmm. opinions seem to be pretty evenly split. Um, with the suede ear pads, I would say uh, kind of a studio monitor like sound. Uh, I, I could actually see them being used as studio monitors with okay. those pads. Uh, sparkly, detailed treble. Yeah. Love the sound signature, three hundred bucks. Yeah. Now I think the FT3 will go down over time, unless they just like keep replacing it, and iterating really quickly. Yeah. But I think if this model stands, it will become a classic. Mm -hmm. For that price, it's such a strong value. So if you're looking for an over-ear headphone that is just really good and it's beautifully built, it is. It's beautifully built. Yeah. The FIO FT3. Now they also will have a planar magnetic model. Yes. Called the, the FT5. FT5. I only yeah. heard a prototype briefly. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of distracted because we were, it was a whole bunch of us kind of hanging out. Anyway, so I didn't really get to spend any dedicated time listening to it. So for me, so it's, I'll, I'll say what's in it. Yeah. Um, a 90 millimeter planar magnetic driver, mm -hmm. 36 ohm impedance, open back design, magnesium alloy housing. Um, two types of ear pads for tuning. Just like the FT3, yeah. Yeah, like the FT3. Four types of connectors included, like mm -hmm. the FT3. Um, and it was a CanJam London. I heard it just briefly, and I, 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 not even close to long enough. But yet, it's one of the headphones for sure, given the FT3's performance, that I yeah. want to spend time with. And it's only 449 449 for their planar magnetic headphone. I, I have to hear that. Yeah, same here. So Fio's exhibit for over-ear headphones, which I know a lot of people don't think of Fio when they think of over-ear headphones, but start doing that now.
Yeah. Uh, and yeah, that's a can't miss. Now, Odyssey is primarily known for their full-size planar magnetic headphones like their LCD series or their electrostatic headphone with the carbon, but it's easy to sometimes forget the fact that they do produce studio reference headphones for professionals or for those that like a more studio reference sound, like the LCDX, the MM500, which is part of their Manny Mariquin line, and for those who don't know, Manny Mariquin is a Grammy award-winning engineer and producer. He's part of their professional development team. Well, they recently, not too long ago, released a more affordable reference headphone in that Manny Mariquin line, the MM100. It's only 400 bucks, but it's got a 90 millimeter planar magnetic driver inside, and it's only 475 grams. So as far as Odyssey headphones go, that's on the lighter side. Yeah, yeah. That is. Very comfortable. You can listen to it for hours, which is good because it stays near my desk and I listen to it for hours. Yeah, you use it the way it's supposed to be used as a studio monitor. Yeah, I so use you, it for work. You use it here in the studio to edit videos audio and um yeah you pretty much stole it right I away did. so when it was announced i remember you were so excited to, oh, yeah. about it i heard it i think the first time in munich yeah and then when they when we got ours uh you pretty much listened to it and said all right that's mine and well, you yeah. took it to your desk and now we pretty much never see it because uh, the beautiful thing is that it doesn't just work for professional uses yeah. it's a fantastic music headphone it too. really is if you like a more referency linear sound signature Oh, it's phenomenal. Would you call it one of the best value Odysseys then? Oh, no doubt. Okay. It's only I, 400 bucks. I, I agree. I yeah. agree from what I remember last then, time I heard it. And it's got some cool features. For example, it's got that dual entry, but single-sided cable entry. So whether your devices are on the right-hand side or the left-hand side of your desk, you just switch to that side. It makes it easy, very comfortable to work. It's a wonderful little system. All right, no joke. I'm going to take that from you tonight just so I can borrow oh, it for the night. I'll get it back to you mine. tomorrow. I'll get it back to you tomorrow. All right, another Odyssey I want to mention, though, is the Maxwell. Yes. We, I mean, we, we've talked, everybody knows the LCDs. So I want to go. Uh, so the Maxwell is their flagship gaming headset. Mm -hmm. And we both love the Maxwell. Yes. We have several Maxwells because I yep. ordered the ultraviolet version mm -hmm. the moment it was announced. That was the one they did special edition with Xbox. Right. Um, love it. Yeah. The finish. We, I, I have beautiful. an Xbox and a PS5. You have a PS5. Yep. And we have the PlayStation versions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's a great gaming headset. Yeah. That I, I would say it's the best gaming headset I, I would say that I've ever used. Yeah, I'd agree. Okay. The the thing is, though, from a more head-fi, audiophile standpoint, mm -hmm. it also happens to be one of the best wireless headphones you can buy today in terms of sound. Yep. And it has EQ signatures as well that you can, you know, different Yeah, multiple ones, built in. Yeah, that you can listen to. It's not a noise canceller, no. to be clear, but it is closed back. Yeah. But as sound signatures go and audiophile sound signatures go, I would say it is one of the best wireless headphones you can buy today. Oh, yeah. So another, I would say that's also one of Odyssey's best value products. Now, we recently put out a video for the Dan Clark Audio E3, so if you want our in-depth thoughts into the design and the sound signature, definitely check that out. You even stopped by their factory as part of that video. for Yeah, a the, little... the video is really an interview with Dan Clark yeah. where we talk about the E3 in depth, yeah. and then also, of course, a review, and that includes measurements as well. Yeah, so definitely check that out for the full breakdown, but I want to give a couple of quick highlights just so you know what's inside of this. It's the fifth generation of the Dan Clark Audio Driver, which is using an updated and improved version of their AMTS, the Acoustic Metamaterial Tuning System that they developed. Very, very cool design. We definitely break that down in more detail in that video. Uh, it uses Dan Clark Audio's V Planar Knurling designs, and it's built from titanium, aluminum, and carbon. But the coolest hardware feature I personally think in this system has to be that Gorilla Glass faceplate. It looks stunning. It makes it look like an open headphone, but yep. it's, it's still closed. Yeah. And... Kind of like uh, Dan has done in the past, it's a closed headphone that sounds open. It's a very open back sounding closed back headphone. It definitely sure. is. Now, I think for the price, I, I don't know how Dan Clark already feels about this specific thing, but for the price, it probably comes closer to the stealth in terms of overall performance, which is their flagship closed back. Oh sure. Then then maybe maybe then maybe they'd want it to. But I, so admittedly, I prefer the stealth. I'm to, the E3. Yeah, you prefer the E3. I prefer this. I prefer the stealth because it has a smoother top end right is that's one reason um and you prefer the e3 i think you know for the price difference i think it'll be more evenly split probably given the differences than um you know then maybe the prices the price difference would indicate yeah so and and both are again very open sounding closed back headphones so i would say at their exhibit listen to both mm -hmm. and compare them yeah uh because they're wonderful closed back headphones and then if you want to hear an even more open sounding headphone, right. go with an open back 
Dan Clark audio headphone. I would say the flagship Expanse, their yep. open back flagship Expanse is also a can't miss. But if I had to say, if you're limited for time, compare the two closed back ones. Vocal will be at the show. Yes, they, they will. always put on a beautiful exhibit. Oh, yeah. And they're going to have, of course, several models there. Mm -hmm. I want to focus on two primarily. Sure. Two models that represent, for me, the high references for their respective categories. The first is the Focal Utopia 2022. Yes. I don't think it's called the Utopia 22. Isn't it just the it's Utopia? Not. It's just Utopia, yeah. But I'm going to call it the 2022 because that's when it was released, and it replaced the original right. Utopia. The original Utopia, when it was released many years ago, was revolutionary. Mm -hmm. It was the most resolving, and, and still is, yeah. the most resolving dynamic headphone ever made until now the new version came out, which I right. think edges it out. The Utopia 2022 and the original Utopia use their Brillium driver. Yes. We've measured it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so it's measurably spectacular. We did some crazy measurements with Gross for some oh, yeah, AES yeah. headphone yeah, event uh, several years back. That was the original Utopia. Yeah. But the the re the resolution on the Utopias is among the most resolving of any type of headphone, not just oh, yeah. dynamic. But for dynamic, the most. Mm -hmm. The most resolving. The Utopia 22 addresses... Everything I wanted addressed about the original Utopia. I thought the original Utopia was a little bit too bright, a little bit too lean. I EQ'd it. Yeah. The new Utopia, I do not EQ. It has a little more richness and smoother, more refined treble. Mm -hmm. So I find it actually more resolving than the original Utopia, even though the original Utopia is brighter. Some people mistake that sometimes, I think, for resolution. Right. No, to me, the new Utopia is definitely more resolving. So you want to hear my high reference for dynamic headphones, what I still think is one of the most resolving headphones in the world, period, Utopia. New Utopia, 2022. <laughs> All right. So then the other one I want to mention is the Batisse, yeah. which is their uh, wireless over-ear headphone, their mm -hmm. Bluetooth uh, over-ear headphone. That is my current high reference for music listening, Bluetooth, noise-canceling headphone. Right. Okay. It cancels noise enough to be usable on a plane. Sure. It's not the most noise-canceling noise canceller, though. No. So if you want that, go ahead. Buy a Sony, Bose, or Apple. Yep. You'll probably get more noise-canceling on a plane with that. In mm -hmm. fact, you probably, I'm almost certain you will. Oh, uh, yeah. But I don't listen to music hardly ever through my Apple, Bose, or Sony headphones. Right. But my Batisse, I listen to music through frequently. And so I carry it a lot. And what's cool about that one, in addition to the fact that I just love its default signature, mm -hmm. they added a, a firmware update that has the Harman target and yes. it's the Harman AEOE target. Yeah. So you can compare the two. I prefer the default signature. It's a little richer, a little mm -hmm. smoother, kind of right where I like it. Yeah. Um, but I think some people will prefer the Harman, and so you can compare both. So if you want to hear a, a deliberately Harman targeted and a specifically mentioned Harman targeted right. uh, headphone, listen to the Batiste with the Harman target selected mm -hmm. uh, in the app. So those are the two I'd most recommend. I also just want to give a quick mention to the Focal Stelia. Yeah. That's been out a long time. It has. It's their Beryllium Driver flagship closed back headphone, and I still love, love, love that headphone. So that's one I think people should listen to as well if they're looking for just a kind of a cost no object closed back headphone. At Can Jam London last year, there was an exhibit that had a constant line. Every single time I walked by, no matter what time of day it was, there was a queue and the seats were completely full. It's from Head Audio. It's the Headphone 2. It was just announced right around that time. Well, at Can Jam New York, they'll get a chance to hear it. So the Headphone 2 is based on the same driver technology as the original headphone, the AMT Air Motion Transformer technology. And it has what Head Audio calls the VVT technology or uh, variable velocity transformation. Now in their words, VVT allows the AMT driver in the headphone to achieve even frequency response across the entire audio spectrum. And when you listen to this, you can see exactly where they're going with this. Yeah. And if somebody is familiar with the original head audio headphone sound, this is a refinement. It is, to me, it feels more even across the, they do a, a really nice job getting everything. It is definitely uh, more spectrum. refined. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. And it's lighter. So the, yeah. the original was like 700 something grams. I don't remember how heavy it was, but it felt heavy on my neck. Yeah. And that was such a bummer to me because I really enjoyed the way it sound. Yeah. Sounds. But I just wouldn't put it on my on my on my head just get, for long because I couldn't. It yeah. was uncomfortable to my neck. This one, the headphone two, is infinitely more comfortable. Oh yeah. It's five hundred and fifty grams, yes. but it's distributed beautifully across my head. Mm -hmm. Plus they have that strap system called the, the head, head band. H-E-D-D band. Yep. -E -D 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 band. band. And it is super like it's like a smart strap system. You can adjust, of course, height. You can adjust even clamping force. Yep. Anyway. 
love this headphone. It is a refinement of the original head in terms of sound. Yeah. I would say its treble is smoother and more refined, which is a big deal for me. Yep. Um, and it's it, as far as between the comfort and the sound, it's all wins versus the original headphone. And this one I can listen to for a long time. Yep. No discomfort whatsoever. I totally dig it. So for me, it's a can't miss. Last year at Can Jam Dallas, we ran into a bit of a conundrum with Meza Audio. We did. No, 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 no conflict or anything. Well, right. well kind of a time conflict. All right. So what happened was, as I recall, we weren't able to mention the Meza Audio Empyrean 2 in the video, were we? We were not. Okay. And the re but yet they showed it at Can Jam Dallas. Did. And the reason was is the embargo was like just a couple days before the show. Yeah. Is that was. what happened? Yep. And so we weren't able to and the and the video went live before that. So yes. we couldn't talk about it. All right. Now we can. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think everybody on the in the community that follows Meza Audio knows about it. Oh yeah. The Empyrean 2 replaces the Empyrean. All right. But it was to me such a jarring model. Yeah. And I mean that. Because I would have expected it to be like some, you know, newer version, a refinement of the original Empyrean. Yeah. But they just revoiced it completely. Mm -hmm. All right. So the original Empyrean, the Elite, which is still their flagship, right, have a romantic sound. The Elite was kind of a refinement of the Empyrean's romantic, lush sound. Yeah. Still resolving, but mm -hmm. lush. So if you wanted neutral, it probably wasn't where you would go. Yep. Um, the Empyrean too. It's neutral. It's yep. like a studio monitor. Mm -hmm. I would say it's uh, you know perceived neutral for me. And it leads me to think that Meza Audio wanted a headphone that could be used for that purpose, for those people. Right. Professionals even. Yeah. Like prof for I can professional audio. Yeah, yeah. I can see it being used in the studio. Uh, so it'd be a flagship headphone in the studio. Sure. So I think a lot of people love the build quality, the style, the comfort of Meza Audio's flagships, mm -hmm. but, but, but wanted something more neutral. The people that wanted the lush sound, right? The elite's still there. Right. But the Empyrean 2 is now more neutral, more studio monitor like, and I think it's going to satisfy a lot of people. Now, thankfully, we're not fighting an embargo for their next announcement. Meza Audio will be showing at the show the Lyric 2. Yeah, we can mention it now. We can actually talk <laughs> yeah, about but, this yeah. one. So, the Lyric 2. It's uh, it's based on the original lyric, but there have been a number of changes inside. So most notably, right away, they've added a quarter wavelength resonator mask, or QWRM, which they say is a precision crafted metal component that strategically covers select openings in the driver frame to effectively attenuate high frequency peaks above 7 kilohertz for a less fatiguing listening experience. Yes, the treble is smoother. It is smoother. Yeah. They also say that the sound of the Lyric 2 has been refined with the help of our community's feedback, and it now falls in between a balanced and warm profile. Totally. I would say it's a very fair representation. Yeah. It's a lovely sounding headphone. It is a very nice sounding headphone, yeah. and I also think it's beautiful. It's so beautiful. it has a Macassar Ebony. I, I'm, Macassar I'm, not familiar, Ebony yeah. I'm not familiar with this one. Yeah, I'm not sure. Either. But they, they say that no two are alike, which, you know, very this common wood. for a lot of wood headphones. <laughs> but it, it it is exquisitely finished. Yeah. So it's that Meza style. Again, attention to detail, you know, all of the fasteners and everything. They're just beautiful. Again, the photos, I, I love how this thing just catches light. Yeah, Meza has a knack for making photographable headphones. They really do. So if you're a fan of the original Lyric, definitely stop by. Check out the Lyric to a Meza Audio exhibit. It's going to be a must hear. And it's also Meza comfortable. It is. Yeah. Raw will be at the show exhibiting. Yes, they will. And if they're not there as Raw requisite, which is, I think, how most people remember them, including mm -hmm. myself. Right. They'll be there as Raw 1995. That's correct. Okay, Raw 1995. Yep. Now, I just want to say that they're known for their ribbon driver headphones. This yes. is not going to change. Um, their ribbon driver, the original SR1A, was an ear speaker type design. Yep. Extremely resolving. Yep. Really special driver. The CA1A. Yes. That I spent very little time with, but heard it at, at, at Munich High End. Mm-hmm. Super resolving again. Yep. Lovely sounding headphone. More conventional design, which I liked. Yeah. Still weird, but but a conventional, more conventional. I want to know what they're doing now with the new headphones. We don't have them yet. Right. I think Alexander has been uh, giving preliminary specs. Uh, yeah, on the, on, on the forums, he's been going on into a little bit of detail. So I do know that there are two models: the Magna and the Imanus. And the Magna is a dual ribbon design, and the Imanus is a triple ribbon design. So I think. They're open backs, and they're more conventional as far as you know their shape, how they sit okay. around the ear. But um, but that's pretty much all I know right now. Yeah, so that for me is a definite can't miss just because I know so little about these. Yeah. And the SR1A and CA1A were intriguing enough for me oh, yeah. to absolutely want to find out what is coming next. Mm-hmm.
Now, Sennheiser is coming to Can Jam, and they are bringing with them the what I consider the best headphone system in the world, the Sennheiser HE1. I think it is definitely the best headphone system in the world. It is yeah. phenomenal. Unfortunately, all the slots have been booked already, so if you don't have a reservation, you won't be able to get a chance. However, they are showing something at the complete opposite end of that spectrum that I think will end up being a big draw, whether or not people already realize it. At CES last month, they showed off the Accentum Plus, and that's going to be at their exhibit. It's a 37 millimeter dynamic driver system with angled transducers inside. It is fully wireless. And when I first popped it on my head, my immediate thought was lightweight and comfortable, a bit on the clampy side, but that'll work itself out. The signature was, it was a, to me, it was kind of more focused on the lower end and the mid range, but it still felt like nothing was lacking in the upper register. Yeah, I, I find it overall quite balanced. Yeah, it, it, yeah. It's, it's a nice signature. I think yeah. a lot of people are going to appreciate it. Yeah, I really like it for the price. Yeah, for sure. So it's based on the original Accentum, and it, the Accentum it will stay in the line. The Accentum Plus is kind of an older sibling to that now. It's going to come with a couple of upgrades, like the adaptive hybrid ANC system. So the original just had a hybrid. This is adaptive. It has anti-wind mode. It has wireless and wired connectivity, which is really nice if you're going to be on a plane or something like that. Uh, it has gesture control, so they've ditched the button interface system, and they've gone to the full touch system. And it has a crazy battery life at 50 hours. Yep. It's it's ridiculous. So they also have personalization from the Sennheiser app. They used to have that little knob system that I didn't care about, but it's a five-band equalizer now. It's it's much improved. Really, I think this is going to be a huge draw of their exhibit. Yeah, I think so too. Because you know the funny thing is, reading an article uh, about uh, an idea or a, a concept called stealth wealth. Oh yeah, yeah. I yeah, think yeah, I read yeah. that same one. Like fancy things that aren't that don't look fancy. They don't look. Th and no. this again, we were both taken by surprise at how how solid the Accentum Plus sounds. Yeah. And but it is very unassuming. Yes. It's 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 not an unattractive headphone to be no. clear. It has actually really nice lines, mm -hmm. but it is so unadorned. Yeah. Right. There's not any flashy logos, no flash whatsoever. Right. So I think for some people that's right up their alley. So I don't know why I thought of. The, the idea of Stealth Wealth just reminded me of the Accentum Plus. Another Sennheiser headphone I have to mention is the HD660 S2. Right. So the HD600 and 650, absolutely legendary headphones, obviously. Some of the most beloved headphones in our community for a zillion years. Mm -hmm. The HD660 S2, and this is going to be at least a mildly controversial statement maybe, is I think the best sounding of the 600 family headphones. Okay. So with it, they return to the 300 ohms of the 600, 650, and the 580 before that. Right. But I just love that it adds bass extension and more bass presence. Mm -hmm. um, and I think maybe even a little more resolution. So, But but this bass presence and bass extension to me were sorely needed. Um, and now we have it with the 660, 660S2. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't heard that, um, and especially if you love the 600, 650, yeah. uh, and I love both those headphones still, listen to the 660S2 um, and let me know what you think in the thread. I'm, I'm going to be very curious to see if anybody comments on that. ZMF Headphones is going to have, I think, the biggest exhibit they've ever had at a Can Jam. Oh, no doubt, yeah. Like literally twice as big. Double. And if you've seen their exhibits at our Can Jams before, that's actually saying something because they're and, huge and, and very well stocked. And the amount of gear they stick in there is just nuts. Yeah, yeah. so we already went over in the desktop uh, the desktop electronics category. Yep. They're coming loaded for bear on amplification. Yes. Okay, so now in over ears, they're going to have two new models. Yeah. Uh, the first is called the Bokeh. Yep. And then the other one is, which we'll get to, is the Caldera Closed. Let's start with the Bokeh. Yep. Love this headphone. So to me, these two new headphones represent everything I love about ZMF. So what do I love about ZMF? I've talked about it before. They are far more engineering focused than I think most people realize Like at the outset. Sure. Uh, their lab, I know a lot of the stuff they have in their lab, the yep. gear. Um, for example, they have two uh, Bruin Care 5128s. Right. But despite their engineering focus, I still feel like they use that all to make headphones that they want to hear. Yeah. Uh, I, you, you like to think that every headphone company does that. But for some reason, it just really comes through. I feel like I'm listening to it, what they want to hear. Right. And obviously, a lot of people want to hear what they want to hear because they are doing really, really well. They're selling a lot of headphones. Yeah. And I can understand why the Atrium remains mm -hmm. one of my favorite headphones at any price. So yep. listen to the Atrium. But let's go with the Bokeh again. Let's talk about that. It is a closed back Essentially a portable headphone, as portable as any headphone yeah. they've ever made. Slimmer profile, 
Um, actually, can you talk about what's in it? You know the driver design. So it's a, it's a slimmer profile, and part of that's due to a liquid crystal polymer 50 millimeter dynamic driver design. Right. It has a more oval-shaped cup as opposed to the more conventional fully round cups from ZMF headphones, and it folds flat. So this could fit in a backpack, and I think they actually have sometime later this year like a, a portable carrying case coming for the Bokeh specifically. That would be nice. Um, it's only 80 ohms, okay. so it's, it's going to be able to be you know more easily driven by your portable devices than perhaps some of their other headphones. And... Um, it uses a lot of the same kind of technology inside, though, like the atrium dampening system. So it is still a ZMF through and through. Now, yeah. if you're not familiar with the ADS, uh, ZMF says that it enables optimization of the airflow resistance to each driver, maximizing each model's sonic capabilities. And that's something you see in their full size, and yet it's still here in a more portable package. And they've been developing the bokeh for years. Yeah, like four or five years now. Right. It's It's been in the works for a while. Um, the one that we have here and... If uh, if you manage to get one of their their very first batches, it's a black limbo wood stained a dark clear. It's very pretty. Um, it's it's machined I think outside of St. Louis. It's built just outside of Chicago. So it's a you know it's a U.S. headphone. Very comfortable. Through. The ear pads are based on the Caldera design yeah. ear pads. Yeah. Uh, that asymmetrical ear side hole orientation. And I want to talk about the sound signature. Yeah. Um, it it's I I it almost has the most traditional. It, it, in some ways, it's the least ZMF headphone I've heard. I would yet, agree. Yet it has ZMF sensibilities. It's kind of hard to put your finger on. Right. Um, it has the essence through it. Yeah, but I mean, this could actually, I think this was one that, they, a ZMF headphone that could be used, I'm trying to think of any other model they make that could be used as like a studio monitor that I described as a studio monitor. This could actually, in my opinion, be, you, you've you used it while editing video and audio. I have. So my question is, is do you think it's usable for that? Oh, I absolutely could. Okay, see, that, yeah. that's what I would have guessed as well. And um, But yet it still has that ZMF essence. Yep. Love this headphone. It's also the first ZMF with three and a half millimeter uh, oh, yeah, yeah. plugs into each into the ear cups. Right. They usually used. I don't remember what it was. The four pin X or a three pin mini three XLRs. Pin LR, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully they'll we'll see some new wood options. I think Zach was hinting at that. So anyway, the Bokeh I think is going to be huge. You said it's already selling, right? I didn't. Realize. They sold the first batch, so they're they sold, sold the out right now. Um, I think they're taking orders at the show, and they may have a couple on hand. Love the Bokeh, and it's a ZMF you can carry with you. And again, it's. Like studio monetary, but yeah. still very ZMF. I, I love that headphone. But you tossed out the name Caldera Closed, and I think a bunch of head fires just went, wait, what was that? Yeah, yeah, don't skip over that. <laughs> yeah, go back. I want to hear more about that. So let's talk about the Closed Caldera. Yeah. Now, Zach put this so simply when I asked him about it. He said, it's a Closed Caldera. And that's such a Zach thing. It's a very Zach thing to say. It's a, it's a 60 ohm all ZMF planar magnetic driver design with the Caldera asymmetrical magnet structure inside. And for those that don't know, that means the asymmetric shape lessens obstructed diaphragm surface area, allowing traces to be less obstructed and more evenly dispersed over the diaphragm. That's a ZMF's description of it. It does include the atrium dampening system that we mentioned before. And there's a, you know, it shares other similarities like the stock wood is white oak. This one comes in a natural or a coffee gold finish, depending on your pick. And Zach did mention there will be limited editions down the road, like like he does for many of their other headphones. Right, right. They're or always thing to do. gorgeous. Yeah. And he does also mention that it's all acoustic tuning. There are no resistors. But for me, the thing that gets me the most is it's just... It's a closed caldera. That's that's, that's such a exact thing what to, he to say. Said. Yeah. yeah, it's a closed caldera, and that yeah. again is the essence of ZMF. Yeah, right. Um, he says that, and that's literally what he said. That's yeah. it. That's it's it. It's a closed caldera. So, so, but that's but, so underselling it. Yeah, because to take a caldera, and it sounds like a closed caldera, right? To take the caldera, you can't you can't just essentially put a rear closed cover over it, and then yeah. you have a closed caldera. It takes a tremendous amount of engineering. Yep. To Close up, you know, to come up with a closed version of a headphone yeah. with their planar magnetic driver that sounds like a Caldera, and he, they, they did it. Yeah. So that one is going to be huge. Oh yeah. That one will have line. Li I think that'll have lines out the doors it because will. I don't know how many rooms. <laughs> couple rooms. There's two rooms. Yeah. So <laughs> that one is going to be huge. How can we not start off the portable electronic section? with this because it's not 1982 <laughs> it is kind of 1982 ish i love this thing okay so fio announces the cp13 yeah uh i don't know maybe 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 they'd been talking about it somewhere else because it caught me off guard i didn't know until it was on this forums yeah so it was on head forums yeah. and then they posted it elsewhere as well um but the cp13 obviously is a throwback product oh yeah i had to scour 
my house to find cassettes to play on it. Yeah, and I don't think I bought one since the late 90s. Yeah, what was it? Tag Team. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. All right. I mine I think mine's slightly better. So anyways, <laughs> I found I found some cassettes and uh the one that I have in here right now. I I I, I mean, I where are you finding these things, right? I had to literally I, turn my house upside down yeah. and I found uh one small part of my cassette collection. So, I don't have tag team in here. What I have is infectious grooves. Yeah. So, uh their front man was Mike Muir of Suicidal Tendencies. It was like a side project. And I hadn't heard that. Well, obviously, since the last time I could play this cassette, because I haven't streamed it since. Yeah. It just never even came into my head. I forgot that Infectious Grooves even was a thing. And then I heard it for the first time on the CP-13. Yeah. Okay. Was there tape hiss? There was. There was tape hiss. Um, was there wow and flutter? I, don't, I couldn't hear any, actually, because yeah. they said it has low wow and flutter. So, uh, <laughs> anyway, um, because I think uh, there's a super large pure copper flywheel. That's literally what it says in the spec super large pure copper flywheel all right which probably reduces of course wow and flutter and of course the key about it is i mean this is a return to as they say also in the specs 100 percent pure analog performance yeah my son who's 19 years old right literally said <laughs> you know how, how does it tape how does that work if that's not digital <laughs> and you know you know that was like trying to explain exactly. it exactly anyway well, there's magnets <laughs> yeah i literally was trying to explain it to him and what a cap stand and a pinch roller are yep. i mean this is like such a throwback now we kind of seem like we're making fun of it but it kind of it's cool how can you not it, it you have to make fun of it a little a little bit yeah because because you're playing cassettes yes but it is literally one of my favorite products of the year yeah so far. I mean, it's early in the year, mm -hmm. but it's one of my favorite products so far because it's fun. Yes. And I will find the rest of my tape collection. It has a sense of humor, and I appreciate that. It does. So what else does it have? Okay, in the specs, customized balanced amplification magnetic head. I don't know what that means. So um, a classic audio file grade op amp, JRC uh, 5532. I remember that part number. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like I don't remember seeing that anytime recently, so I'm going to assume it's, it's old or, right. or not yeah. used as much anymore. High voltage driven motor power supply, uh, full aluminum alloy bicolor body. Love the feel. And the color's awesome. The color's awesome. 13 hours of lithium battery power supply. Mm -hmm. So that's something obviously we didn't have right. last time we were using cassette players, nor, nor, nor did we have a USB-C no, <laughs> input to charge it. Um, there's <laughs> there's no deck, obviously. Right, yeah. Um, uh, dual mode power supply design. Anyway, I love this thing. It is cool. So I need to find more cassettes. Um, I, I don't even know what, what you can. I can't compare it. I haven't used the cassette player in ages. Yeah. Uh, so I don't really have anything to compare it to, and I don't think it can jam. There will be <laughs> anything to compare it to. But I swear to you, if you used cassettes, or even if you didn't, if you if you used cassettes, uh, bring them yeah. to can jam and then play them on the Fio. CP13. Otherwise, I'm not sure what they're going to have on hand to listen to. So bring your own music. Love this thing. Uh, I would not miss it. The other thing that I love, and now getting more modern. Yes. And they sent this one to us, which was as much a surprise to me as the CP13. Mm -hmm. Is this, and I, I have they talked about this on the forums? Uh, they, they have. They have, actually, they have. I think, in yeah. the announcements, the um, yeah. uh, upcoming. So this is the FIO. It's, M on, it's on the roadmap page. It's on the roadmap page. The FIO M23. So this one does not have, I mean, this is so new. Mm -hmm. I was actually surprised they sent this to us because right. this is clearly like pre-production. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Fio, for, for giving us a head, you know, like a kind of an early look at this. And this is going to, I think it's going to replace, it's like, what, what, what is the M11 Plus now, right? Yes. Kind of in that vein? No, it is replacing the M11 Plus. Oh, it is, it uh, is. for sure. Yeah. Now this is going to be around the same price, mm -hmm. maybe a teeny bit more, around $750. Right. It has inside of it for the DAC the AK forty one ninety one EQ plus AK forty four ninety nine EX DAC setup. That's their flagship, isn't I it? I think it is the flagship. And that's a midline mid level player. Yeah. So at that price, I think that will be I'm guessing that'll be the, the lowest price player at the time of its release that uses that DAC. Because I, I think that's still AKM's flagship. Yeah. It has the THX AAA seventy eight plus, mm -hmm. two of them, right? Uh, and it outputs, say, 1,000 milliwatts into 32 ohms versus the M11 Plus is 660 milliwatts into 32 ohms. So mm -hmm. it ups the power yeah, because it's using the uh, THX AAA 78 Plus versus the 78. And it's still dead silent. Dead, dead yeah. silent. 
Um, let's see. Oh, it's and it also puts 236 milliwatts into 300 ohms mm-hmm. uh, versus 90 milliwatts with the with the um, M11 M11 plus. Yeah. So this player I've enjoyed. I have too. A lot. Yeah. And um, I think for anybody in the market for a new DAP, even if you're shopping for a flagship DAP or something in the fifteen hundred dollar range. Mm-hmm. I would definitely give the M23 a listen. I'm going to assume, obviously, it's going to be at the show. I, it they wouldn't be. have sent it yeah. to us. And yeah, the M23 is to me a must, and the and the CP13 yeah. at, at Fio's exhibit. And of course, oh, uh, we, I, I wanted to mention one more thing. Yeah, because they they we should have put this in the desktop electronic oh, right. section. Yeah, uh, but uh, they, they told us too late. They just emailed us recently. They just emailed us yesterday. Yeah. So 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 I want to mention, even though this is a desktop component. The Fio K19. Mm-hmm. So the Fio K19, we don't know a whole lot about it. Looking at the specs, I think it says like a 31 band, highly precise parametric EQ. Yep, very cool. Um, it will be based uh, it, built around uh, DAC wise the ES 9039s Pro mm-hmm. in a dual configuration. It'll have an eight channel THX AAA 788 plus amp. Yep, uh, dead quiet. Uh, I'm sure we haven't used this yet, but we've used other amps with it. Mm-hmm. I think the R9 uses a similar configuration, but don't hold me to it. Maybe, yeah. Maybe. Um, so this one is rated for 8,000 milliwatts output into 32 ohms in ultra high gain mode. Mm-hmm. So some serious juice. Yep. You're going to like this HDMI in out, HDMI arc. I do love that. Uh, then then I, we have some other specs that I won't mention here just because. Anyways, it, 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 MSRP is going to be around $1,200, at least as of nice. uh, right now. And so they'll have that at their exhibit. This looks to me like a shot over the bow of some pretty popular DAX mm-hmm. in that price range from China I can think that, of that are like high value, high performance, like super um, clean measuring DAX. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, of course, we haven't had this one yet. Right. Um, cause they didn't send us the K19 yet. We're going to get one soon, but, uh, so we haven't had a chance to put it on the bench, but that's what it looks like to me. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, you can see in, at, at Fio, their product mix runs the gamut. It does. Uh, so, uh, we've gone from a cassette player to a pretty fancy high end deck. Very modern too. Yeah. Yeah. And a, and a brand new cool player. So anyways, don't miss Fio's exhibit. I mean, I think you and I, we should just hop on over there. Maybe as the first exhibit. Maybe. You know what those are? I do. What are they? They are tubes. I love tubes. You do. I do love tubes. And I love this player, by the way. Yeah. Brand spanking new model from Astel and Kern. This is the Astel and Kern and Ultima SP3000T. Yep. I've hogged it. You haven't had a chance to really use it. No, I have not. So I'm going to talk about it. So they had and have, I think, still a model called the SP2000T. Yeah, I think that's still on the line. Right. So this this is in the flagship line. Mm-hmm. I guess so is the SP2000. They're both A and Ultima models. Yeah. yeah. And the SP2000T for the tubes used Korg new tubes. Mm-hmm. This uses dual Raytheon JAN or Jan 6418 mil spec vintage vacuum tubes. Oh, more traditional tubes. More traditional tubes. And I will say, as much as I enjoy the SP2000T, which we've talked about before, yeah, I prefer the sound of this one. There's more tubey goodness going on here. Yeah. And like the SP2000T, it has... I don't remember what they call it. It's something like a triamp system. And what they're referring to, if that's what it's called, is um, you can go all tube for amplification, Mm -hmm. all solid state, or hybridize it. So somewhere in between. And so that gives you three three different ways that you can listen to it. Now, this adds something else that I don't believe is on the SP2000T. I don't remember seeing an adjustment where you can adjust the current flow to the tubes. Oh. So that is new. And again, it allows you... The ability to tailor the sound, to customize it, to try it different things with your different headphones and earphones. Mm-hmm. And I just love that about this. I also love that it's super responsive, like the SP3000. Again, this is the SP3000T. Yep. Um, it comes with the Snapdragon 6125 octa-core processor, 8 gigs of RAM, DDR4 RAM, uh, twice the amount of RAM commonly found in DAPs. Yeah. So this is, again, very responsive. So when you're moving things around, it responds pretty much immediately. I, I love the improvements they've made to the response times and they're more Yeah, that, not every DAP is like that. Yeah. So the other thing is the DAC is a lovely thing. It's the AKM. I think it's still the flagship. It's the AK 
4499 EX DAC with the AK4191 EQ. Yeah, I do like the year I've heard with those DACs. So they describe it. So like the SP3000, the SP3000T reduces the noise of the digital signal input using the AK4191 EQ, a separate digital Delta Sigma modulator, and then the AK4499 EX DAC processes the analog signal separately. I, I don't know what all that means, but I do know it sounds good. It's lovely. So, so this thing is just... It's got to be one of my new favorite new DAPs for sure. Mm -hmm. um, the chassis is 316L stainless steel with 99.9% .9 pure silver plating, which is also a beautiful thing to behold. And it'll be available May 19, I mean 19, <laughs> 19, May 2024 at authorized dealers worldwide for about 3000 bucks. Okay. So to me, killer DAP. I think one must go to Astle and Kern's exhibit and listen to this. But this isn't the only one, by the way. Another Astell & Kern DAP that I have been using a lot before mm -hmm. the arrival of this is the Astell & Kern Con Ultra. You'd I like that one. Yeah, you referred yeah. to it, I think, in the previous preview video as like a Swiss Army knife. That's like a DAP. kitchen sink a kitchen DAP. Sink, yeah. A kitchen sink yeah. DAP. Um, they, Astell & Kern really intended that one to be more like a desktop hi-fi level performance. Right. You know, it's, it's on the larger side. and it it, But it does also use ES9039M Pro mm -hmm. uh, dual decks. Right. So... It that's has a more massive battery. Massive battery. So, so much power and battery life. Yeah. And then and then more like a desktop component, the Con Ultra also has a separate pre line out on the top panel. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. So that's very cool. Yeah. I also want to mention another DAP that they have that has to be let's do kind of appeals to another thing that I dig a lot. Which one? And that's the SE three hundred. That's oh, the model, right? SE three yeah, hundred. Yeah. The AN Futura? Yes. A N Futura S three hundred S E three hundred. Yeah. It has fully discrete twenty four bit R to R DAC. I think yeah. we mentioned it in the CanJam Dallas preview. We did. You absolutely have to check that one out too. So if you're curious about R to R DAX, or if you already know you like them, mm -hmm. then you listen to the SC300 if you haven't heard it already. Right. If you're curious about them, um, and you're also looking just for a fl good flagship class DAC, mm -hmm. another thing to audition. So Astle and Kern's exhibit, if you're into DAPs, absolute must visit exhibit. Now, we've talked about FIA, we've talked about Astell and Kern, and there's another player that will be at CanJam New York that people will be wanting to check out. It's going to be at Bloom Audio's exhibit, and it comes from Ibasso. It's the DX260. Now, it's been a while since I've played with a, a current Ibasso player. I did try the DX300 briefly at a CanJam, but here in the office, I mean, the, the most recent we want, one we have is several years old I at think, this point. I think it's the DX220. I know. Yeah. I'm ashamed to say that we need to we need to update our Ibasso DAP collection here for sure. It's been a bit, yeah. Yeah, it's been a bit. So now we don't actually have a DX260 here. Right. So we haven't had a chance to hear it or play with it or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, now, Steve from Bloom Audio yeah. did, th th first of all, their YouTube channel is great. It is. So sure, they sell the products, but they do really nice video reviews they of do. the products. So this is one where they reviewed it, and he said it punches above its price okay. but i love what he's how he specifically describes it so he talks about how how it is very resolving mm -hmm. um, up my alley yeah de definitely up your alley then he says that it kind of it, it, it would sound to him like something that would go really well with if i recall correctly uh like warm sounding um iems okay which i tend to favor sometimes actually probably certainly more often than you do right so that interests me he talked about it sound staging and everything anyways he had a lot of nice things to say about it if you I don't know that you've actually seen Bloom's video channel. You should if you haven't. Oh, I've definitely seen the channel. Oh, okay, yeah. good. Yeah, they do really nice videos. So anyways, um, we don't have it again. So I'm really looking forward to hearing it. I will bring a couple of my warm IEMs to Bloom's exhibit to try it. Mm -hmm. I'll, uh, why don't you talk about what's in it? Yeah, you know. there, there's a couple of specs that I pulled that really caught my interest. First of all, it's based on the CS43198 DAC. It's an Okta DAC chip matrix. So there's actually eight DACs inside of there running that. It uses Qualcomm 660 SoC with 4 gigs and 64 gigs of storage. And one of the cool things that stood out to me was that it has a removable removable back cover. So if the user needs to replace the battery, whether it be because the battery is just getting old or they wanted to potentially swap out for a different battery for whatever reason, they have that option. It it prevents... Uh, obsolescence, obsolescence, I guess. Obsolescence, yeah. yeah. And, and I love that. It's, it's going to be a long-lasting DAP for you. Yeah, this is... So again, if... Uh, for anybody watching this, check out Bloom Audio's YouTube channel. Watch the review on it. Definitely then check it out at CanJam New York. I will be doing that for sure. So, so why? Yeah, you haven't heard it either, so you should as well. Yeah. Jude, look what I have. <laughs> it's in my hand now. It's finally back at the office. I haven't seen this thing. It's like a cryptid. It disappeared. 
<laughs> and someone once told me that it existed, but I don't even believe them anymore. Yeah, it's 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 a mystery for you, but uh, yes. but it's no enigma uh, enigma to me. I I I, I use that quite a lot. Yeah. Um. So, I like the tubes. You do. Yeah. So that is the red part. Yes. We'll start with that is the Wu Audio Tube Mini. We talked about it in a previous, in at least one previous preview video. We did. Um, that is a dongle DAC, and it is a tube dongle DAC. So um, it so DAC amp. Yes. But it's not a traditional dongle. So in the sense that for a lot of dongles, you use them on the go. Yeah. I would not necessarily recommend using that on the go because it's mm -hmm. a tube amp or a tube DAC amp. Um, and so there's some microphonics. Yeah. So you use it when you get to where you're going and you don't necessarily use it while you're getting to where you're going. Makes sense. I, I, I hope that makes yeah. sense. And I think I've said that before. So love the way it sounds because it reminds me of a, of a full size, a nice full size tube system. Mm -hmm. Actually, specifically, it reminds me of their WA8. I always forget the nickname. The oh, the, uh, the Eclipse. The Eclipse. Yeah. And and so that's a, so it's a lovely thing. Now the, the puck, the, the base that you're holding yeah. is actually called the Wu Audio two mini power base. It just arrived very recently. And Jack Wu um, describes it. He says the goal was to integrate the two mini into a more user-friendly mini desktop rig. Mm -hmm. Mission accomplished. And it's great for a, a small footprint system, tube system. Yeah. While it reduces vibration and chances to knock it over, the base is actually an external power supply powered by the battery. The sound improvements are substantial. Um, so there's a charging and USB input ports and a power switch allowing the user to set it once and be done with it. Okay. So I totally dig that because, again, I've just been using the dongle laying on the desk mm -hmm. kind of with the cables attached to it. This gives it elegance, and according to Jack, makes it sound better. We just got it recently, so I haven't really done any big comparisons back and forth. Sure. But he says to run it from battery. So okay. you can you can run it while it's plugged in. Yeah, I mean, but, it's running right now. But if you run it from battery, he said it sounds better. Okay. So I will try that. So I highly recommend checking out the Tube Mini and the Tube Mini power base at Wu Audio's exhibit. Mm -hmm. But also, of course, when you see that, it will be this small thing amidst many much larger tube amps yeah. and, and some not super large tube amps. Yeah, like one of my favorites, the WA7E, the electrostatic. Oh, yeah, that one. That's the yeah. smaller one. Yeah. And they have amps to drive electrostats at, at different price ranges. They have amps to drive dynamics at different price ranges, all the way up to like super ultra flagship stuff. So anyway... In the don't let the tube mini get lost in that mix. Yeah. Definitely audition that. Oh, look. It's another thing that I've never seen in a long, long time. <laughs> it's another mythical beast. I admit. I admit. I'm kind of a gear hog lately. A little bit. A little bit. A little, a little bit. bit. But this one, yeah, you haven't spent a lot of time with. So I'll, I'll talk about it. This is the Mass Kobo Model 475. I have talked about it yeah. in at least one other preview, maybe two. I think two. And I love this thing. And I love it so much, but there are some reasons because it's so quirky that that are almost surprising yeah. in terms of that I still love it so much. So let's let's show one of the some of the things. This is the it runs on four AA batteries. It does. That's one way you can power it. I use rechargeable ones. And then you know, we'll sh show a picture you there's there's four dip switches in here. This is how you switch between They're buried in there. Yeah, buried in there for uh high and low gain and I use a really sharp spudger. Let's see if I can put that on camera right there to flip those switches. Yep why there's not just a switch on the front. I don't know, but there's not. And then um, the only input is a balanced or, well, a, it's not necessarily balanced, single-ended or balanced, both. which you love. I do. 4.4 millimeter, yeah. so Pentacon input. So that can be balanced or single-ended. Yep. And then it has, for headphones, two separate outputs, one for balanced, one for single-ended. Right. And you have to choose unbalanced or balanced, which you like. Oh, yeah, I, I appreciate you that. You think that is how all Pentacon inputs should be. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I kind of agree with you there. You can also power it, if I didn't mention, from USB-C into the front. And that's appreciated. It is, but it's just such a strange... It, it's. I know it's a portable uh, uh, amp, mm -hmm. but I use it as a desktop amp a lot. Believe it or not, I actually use this a lot um, right next to a DCS Lena stack. Yeah. So most of the time with the Lena stack, I'm using the Lena amp. Sure. But every once in a while, I take. Uh, I had a special cable made by Arctic Cables, mm -hmm. and they made me a, a, a XLR to 4.4 balanced. Yes. Um, and I, I'll plug it into this. So I'll swap those connectors and use this in the Lena stack sometimes right. when I want to hear the Mass Kobo sound uh, with some of my in ears. So what is it about the sound? You know, it's really it's one of those things with amps that's hard to describe, but you know it when you hear it. Mm -hmm. uh, the sound staging is beautiful. Um, it's very detailed in a way that's also romantic. Yeah. I don't really know how to 
to put it. It has that magic. It has magic. Yeah. And so the mass Kobo, I, I don't remember the flagship model. I think it's the desktop one. 465? I think it's the, I think that's right. And that one, it's a much bigger amp. It's also it is. much, much more expensive. Yes. And everybody who hears it, like, wants it. It's just a question of being able to afford it because it's expensive and it takes a while to make. But they'll have that there too. So mass Kobo is coming to CanJam New York from Japan. Oh, they're coming. Yeah, Directly. I think they are. And, nice. and so, so um, now you have been, and, and they, oh, so I should say they have quite a cult following. Yes, they do. And so the first time I interacted with them was at the, now you've been to uh, the e earphone show. Yeah, I've, I've been to Japan. Show, yeah. Um, but you, you've been to Fujiya Avic, the store, but not the show. Correct. So it, it, the Fujiya Avic show is great because they actually have a lot of esoteric stuff. Mm -hmm. And many years ago, it was the first time I ran into Mass Kobo. Yeah. Um, knew I always had to have a piece. And then they finally, then they made this one I can afford. So yeah. So here we are. So do check it out. Um, maybe, <laughs> maybe you should go to the exhibit. It's going to be the only way you get to hear it. Yeah, it's cheaper uh, than Japan. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Check it out at Can Gem New York. Now, as Brian said, at the beginning of what is now a very long video, we really have missed you guys. We've missed you a lot. And we're looking forward to seeing you again at CanJam New York 2024. And again, that's happening March 9th and 10th at the Marriott Marquis Hotel in Times Square. Now, we said earlier also this is going to be the biggest CanJam to date. And it is going to be the biggest CanJam to date. So we had no chance of showing you most, not even much, of the gear that will be at CanJam New York. So... Scrolling on the screen now are a list of the companies and brands that will be represented at CanJam New York. So we'll see you at the show, and we'll also see you on the forums at headfi.org. And please don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment.